I just help a man up to his feet or hold a newborn But no matter what I do, my hands remembering my rifle, yeah Life's hard, I know that Still wouldn't change shit I wouldn't go back, yeah I wouldn't go back Feelings I hold back Memories fade, yeah They go fast, yeah They go fast Good times to come and go Survive the highs and lows Just take it step by step I guess, yeah, I suppose Good times to come and go Survive the highs and lows Just take it step by step Welcome to Veteran State of Mind, Corona Watch. We're just going to... Um, they should just call it COVID-20 instead of COVID-19. I know... What's COVID? COVID's like the disease, I guess, or the whatever. Oh, wait, once once, once, once you contract the virus, then you've got COVID. I don't know. It's like the difference between HIV and AIDS. Right, I have I don't, I don't with really me... Know. I should know. Um, from, but it's 2020. I have with me from the uh, Center for Disease Control, <laughs> the <laughs> Director of Central Disease Control, Nate Boyer. Um, he's got a lot of experience with dealing with diseases, <laughs> mostly. <laughs> Most of them mostly are in three his foot lower. <laughs> <laughs> three foot, how tall do you think you are? Um, no, mate, thanks for coming on the podcast. But let's let's just roll in this corona thing, because, um, well, it could be by the time I air this podcast that uh, we are... A lot yeah, no stuff. one will listen because they're all dead. Well, no, could they're going to be busy. They're going to be busy skinning each other in the streets. Purge, Purge 2020. I actually hate the fucking movie, The Purge. Um, but... I'm starting to like take my hat off a bit more to the directors now because I'm like, actually, I p- think people probably would go through and do something like that. It's mass hysteria in the streets. I haven't seen anything like it. It doesn't really seem like it though, dude. I mean, if no, you drive around LA, does not. it seem crazy? No, it's because what we we're just talking about is it's media just social media, things. man. And obviously, it's a real the thing. Media, it's a real threat. We are a, an aspiring it's party. It's a real yeah. threat. But when yeah, exactly. To... Although, un- unlike the unlike the actual media, I forget to bring in my uh, copy and read the ads. So this podcast is now advertless because I left my phone in the car. Yeah, you. So good. I need to take some lessons from the um, from the media. Brought to you by coronavirus. Brought, brought to you by <laughs> coronavirus. Stay in your fucking houses. Um, obviously, we're not listening to that opinion. I think this whole corona thing, mate, it's um, just really illustrative of how you as a person view life. Because it's like, I've seen people, I've seen, there's not really like an in-between reaction that I've seen from people. Mm. It's either they've gone in a full fucking like headless chicken panic mode, um, or they're like, this is stupid, can't stop living our lives every time there's like something like this. Because there's always going to be one. Like that's the way the world works. There's it the, plagues there's, happen. Yeah, there's constant there's constantly a turnover of new viruses and stuff. Um why this one's caught on more than any other, I think Tony Romo's behind it with his corona <laughs> with his corona sponsorship. Um I mean let's be honest, everything he's done has always ended badly, so his corona sponsorship wow. is gonna be the same. I actually love Tony Romo. Shout out for him. Give me fifty points in fantasy football once. Um, once. But once. Once. <laughs> but look, this stuff happens all the time. There's always dangers out there. Um I pointed out to someone the other day that I remember driving through Texas once and I saw a sign. It was like, I think in 2017, there was 3,700 road deaths in Texas in a year. You know, people die, unfortunately. And yeah, people die. And um, I just don't get why this has caused way more of a panic than whatever the last fucking thing well, was. It, it's because it hasn't peaked yet. We don't really, you know what I mean? Like if you look at Italy, like a lot of people have died that have contracted it. But... Um, so we're trying to mitigate that. But here's the thing: well, they, they would all. I mean, people, you can't right? do nothing. You can't do nothing. But they're all people, right? Mostly. Now, yeah. old or we, people or have a tendency or to die anyway. Uh, immune systems. Yeah. yeah, like old people. Are, I hate to break it to people, but old people are at that stage where they're probably going to be dying of something. For sure. No, 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 no. I'm so not if disagreeing wasn't with this, that. It was going to be someone else, and I don't see why well, that should stop me going fucking clubbing. Well. Yeah, maybe not clubbing, but the the whole cancel life thing is not the answer to, yeah. to me either, man. Like it's it's uh, it's tough though, because if you think of we talked about it in the car over here, man. Uh, we won't go into the deep details of what you said because it was ridiculous. It is hilarious, <laughs> but like Obviously. people, you know, people will come in contact. Like I have. Of it, I have young nieces and nephews. You know what I mean, and like I, I have like well, ones that are like babies, and like the babies spe- specifically. The baby, you know, I I would not want them to come in contact with anybody that's carrying it, whether they're f- having symptoms or not. So like I get it from that standpoint. Yeah. But you know, to your point, most people it will just be like a flu or less that contract it. You know, it will just be like a, a like a little more than a cold. But. uh at least we know that as of now. I'm no expert. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, and the other thing as well is at this point, I've made so much fun of it. I'm guaranteed to get it at some point now. Like, but, there's no but way. I'm, but I'm with you, man. The absolute, like, 
I went to the grocery store down in South Central the other day mm -hmm. um, just to go to the bank because they got the, they got the only Wells Fargo that's open till seven p.m., which is awesome. Right. And I go in, and there's just like people shouldering multiple packages of toilet paper. Everyone's freaking what is out. The, what is the thing behind it's the toilet like, paper? There's stuff all over the aisles. Everyone's like madness. Dude. But what is what is the thing behind? I don't the know. I guess paper. it makes you just excessively shit. Maybe. But it doesn't. <laughs> I know. I, I don't know. But I don't know where it's this, because somebody I, I tweeted some, it. Somebody some, tweeted, some "Hey, great, we're having a shortage of toilet yeah, paper," and then some someone retweeted it, and then yeah, everyone the freaked out. Companies. Genius. Like, toilet paper moguls oh, are dude. swimming like Scrooge McDuck. I wish I had. I wish I had a piece of the pie in any toilet paper company or hand sanitizer. You know, so wealthy. The other thing about toilet paper, dude, is like there's some things that like if you run out of um, if you run out of water, people are buying pallets okay. of yeah. hand sanitizer, but dude, like okay, and toilet check, paper check this and, and, and water. There's some, some things you have to have, like food. You can't make do without toilet paper. Take a shower. You, you can do without. Hose yeah, off. You right can after. do without do toilet paper. Like, I do it all the time. <laughs> it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> Take it from people who have been in the military. You can live without toilet paper yeah, when you dude. need to. Um, they did it for you know thousands of years. Yeah, toilet go paper Roman is a new style. Invention. Make yourself a nice uh, brush. Basically, yeah. Google it. Google, Google go, go Roman Middle East. Brush. Just use your left hand. Yeah, you, know? you don't or, shake with or that. Or right, one. if you're left-handed. No, you no, shouldn't be shaking. It's hands always, it's always, though. always left, man. Don't be weird, isn't it? I don't know, dude. I was more. Interested. I'm, yeah, I'm not trying to shake any hands. You just did it when we walked in here. Yeah, that's a good point. I did. Fucking damn, damn <laughs> my, damn my fucking great upbringing. Um, but yeah, this, 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 it's a weird one because I guess I can understand there being, if there's like a genuine, like say there's an earthquake and it's a, like imagine a catastrophic earthquake, I can imagine people why they would panic by water and stuff like that kind of makes sense. Yeah, for sure. But this, it's, it's the fact that it's so ludicrously nothing to do with what's going on and people are still doing it. And it's been like, well, as of, as of last week, 38%, they did a poll, 38% of the people thought it was related to the beer. Like we're stupid. Well, who did, who were they polling in this thing? People, it doesn't matter. No, it doesn't matter if you're polling the 38 percent of the dumbest people. That's still stupid. That's insane. Why do I want to come over to this country? Honestly, that's because it's fun. Nuts. I mean, it is fun. Like those 38 percent of people make it. We a have while, some right? really, really smart people too. Yeah, we're very diverse. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a melting I'll pot say, of absolute morons. I will say that for America, geniuses. I definitely feel when I'm out here, there's far more like the ends yeah. of the spectrum. Elon Musk apart. is here, bro. Yeah, well, he's you from know, South Africa, though. But he's smart, and he moved to America. Exactly. That's the thing. Everyone, like, I think that's kind of the thing. Is That's, like, same with uh, same with athleticism over here. You've got, like, the greatest athletes in the world and the fatties. Yeah, that's true. Like, that's true. you know, you get I was thinking, thing, of, like, man. the whole sports bar culture is very kind of interesting, isn't it? This idea of, you know, people going to watch other people exercise while you sit there and devour plates of nacho and beer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's at no point, like at no point when you like stuff in your face, do you think, oh, maybe instead of like, I could actually, there's nothing stopping you. Like, okay, you can't do it in front of a stadium of 10,000 people. There's nothing stopping you actually just leaving the bar and going for a football round. Oh, actually, you know a little bit about that, wouldn't you? Because you know what? Let's go back. Let's forget this Corona stuff for a bit. Like we can do twenty minutes without coronavirus talk, ish. Actually, no. First one, I am gonna have one more complaint about coronavirus. Go. Sports channels, stop talking about coronavirus. Your job There's no is games. Your on, job dude. is to talk about sports. Why talk about what sports? Rerun all ones. Like, let's. They're have, all getting canceled because of the coronavirus. Preview. That's what they're okay, about. let's have preview. Preview fan, fantasy league for next year. Fantasy football. For what? For football? Yeah. If we're alive. There's other. We'll we be fine. Know. There's other, know, and, and you know, my, my <laughs> league, you know, we, I wouldn't mind bringing some new blood into my league anyway. So if we have a couple of spots open up, not a big deal. But, yeah. dude, we got, uh, we've got, you know, like, wait a minute. It's like if After 9 wanna... 11, should they have been talking about sports? Yes! It's a sports channel. No. It's a fucking yes. sports channel. Yes. Do push ups. No. Fuck you and your push ups, right? <laughs> Let's talk, talk people through, um, talk people through a bit about your background. Because, so, like, we were both saying, actually, before we go into this, and I've said this on the podcast before. I don't want to... I say... Well, the word dwell probably isn't the right word, but I'm going to use it. Um, I think there's too much time spent by veterans talking about the good old days, quote-unquote, air quotes. Um, but I do think it's also important to get to know, uh, you know, to know a bit about that because then it gives context to kind of what kind of comes after. So just talk people through, um, first of all, like, you know, how you ended up going into the military... And then let's pick up from there. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. By the way, the uh, resting on the laurels thing is not my, not my bag. But but also like, 
the thing I fear most about going to veterans events is just getting cornered by someone that wants to talk shop and just like talk about, you mm-hmm. know, the pipe hitting days in Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm just like, dude, I don't, I don't want to talk about that at all. Not because I'm like, ah, oh, PTSD. I'm just like, dude, it's, yeah. It's I just good. good. You did it. I did it. We all did it. We know. Yeah. It's you like know? talk about like our great times in high school too. Yeah. Yeah, not really. But, it, but it's funny, like it's, every now and again, I do, I quite like one of those nights. Like every now and again, they if it's with be, someone that I have that I'm on the same page with, man, but like yeah. just to do it, but someone like, that I don't but in know, general, especially but especially in the circles that you move in now, I mean, it's potentially an everyday occurrence for you if you weren't, you know, if you weren't, ca- you know, yeah, like. So you you know you 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 weren't like a typical kind of like a military. No, I I never really either. thought about it seriously growing up. I mean, in high school, I did have a recruiter come over to the house, but it was more just because I had no idea what I wanted to do. I knew I didn't want to go to college. And so I thought, oh, maybe I'll join the army or something. Had this guy come over, you know, met with me, met with my parents. And I was not really like serious about doing it though. And I didn't at the time. I, I graduated high school. I worked on a fishing boat for a while and rode a bike taxi, was did it, all was kinds it, of odd okay, jobs. I'm interested in San Diego. Fishing boat. San Diego. So, so what was, what, what were you doing on there? It was a deckhand. Right. So uh deckhand. Okay. Hey, <laughs> I thought you were gonna go there. No, I wasn't gonna go there. I got my, can you not tell I got serious face on? When I when I lean in my hand like this, this is serious face. When I lean back like this, this is that's joke face. All right, so you're in serious <laughs> face right now. Uh, so basically, it was a charter fishing boat. We were catching tuna, albacore, yellowtail, stuff like that. We'd go out about a hundred miles offshore, and basically, it was like forty or so people would pay to come you know sport fish and i'm like gearing their lines up um helping them with casting and depth and when they're when they get something hooked up like the technique to reel you know what i mean and keeping the keeping the slack out and letting the fish run and all that stuff and then when it gets close to the boat uh gaffing it so it's just this long uh shaft like <laughs> yeah so you just like beside it on the side of the it's boat. it's like a bamboo shaft yeah. with a hook on the end and you just lean over the side of the boat and you like hook the fish in the head and then pull it into the side so this wasn't catch and release there no not <laughs> at all man and then you you basically you get you get the fish you straddle it because it's big and it's like flopping around and you like stab your dykes uh or like which are like pliers into the fish's head and then like open them up to try to like just kill it and then it you know usually dies or you smack it in the head with a with a hammer oh, so brutal it's very brutal Poor but fish. it's quicker for the fish man you want to you want it to suffer on the boat you know? i just want to, i don't want him to be dead anyway i want him to be living don't you like sushi you wanted to, you were just talking about going to eat sushi this is how you catch it yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's cool being a hypocrite all right yeah look it up we're in la i get to be as hypocritical as i want that's true that's true um so anyway did that and then moved up here to los angeles because i was interested in film and tv i didn't i had no idea where to start i took it took some acting classes um but honestly, I just partied, man. I wasn't really into it. It was early 20s, and I just, I had, man, I just was like, you know, I had late form teenage angst. It's What's just that? like, oh, just like, whatever, the world's a mess anyway. What's the oh. point? What's the point? You know what I mean? Yeah. Just that kind of. You, you was just talking in the car about how the world needs a good play. <laughs> yeah, we, we <laughs> still got it. <laughs> this isn't the worst. This is this maybe not isn't the worst thing. A reset button now and again yeah. is not the worst thing in the world. Potentially, I mean, I'm sorry. If some, I sometimes people, you can do it through meditation. Yeah, I think, and if if I go, look, I go. Look, man, mate, I'm people, not I think this, this else, is going to be episode 44, I think 45. Um, as I always, tell people when making jokes about stuff, it's not because we don't care. It's because it's called being. It's because we it's military. really don't care. It's, yeah, we, we couldn't <laughs> give a flying fuckers about your dead grandma. Um, of course, we could, but. Well, we that don't. Is, we we could. We do. We, we don't. We don't. <laughs> but we could. We <laughs> well, we, how can you care about? How can you care about someone you've never met? It's an interesting uh, side topic. No, I'm just kidding. But no, it's dude. The but the thing is about um about you know about humor and stuff like that is. Oh, it gets you I through some hard the, stuff the, in pe- life, man. Yeah, exactly. And it's the people who care. I think if it's the people who care, like if you're making jokes about things, like Ricky Gervais is someone I really like, and what I really like about a lot of his jokes is that. There's always like a real point, but like what he says might sound brutal to begin with, but there's usually a really kind of like socially like um like a real a real point about it's like, like Bill a Burr window too. on society. Isn't a Bill Burr yeah. ever? Bill Burr's a yeah. Same Bill way. Burr's yeah. brilliant. Um, Dave did like so like this year Dave Chappelle did a, the new stand up which amazing, was brilliant. Yeah. Bill Burr's one was brilliant too. Those two were were great, and they get like a lot of stuff for being um you know like a lot of shit for for being 
you know, quote unquote brutal. controversial yeah. or brutal. Yeah. But it's like, well, but everything that they're pointing a light onto is important and important stuff. And if you can't have those conversations, then like the fact that they're bringing it up means that they do care. And I find that very and the fact hard. that it pushes people's buttons because there's truth behind it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so and like anyone as well, it's like actually thinks that because they made a joke like that that they actually, you know, you wish that Dave, Dave, Ch- Dave Chappelle's like his abo- like his abortion one was probably the one that I felt was like the closest to the bone in his new one. Um, but that doesn't mean he wants anyone to go through, you know, to be to be in a position where they do feel torn between like that. It doesn't mean he wants anyone to be in that position. But the fact is, people are. And he's like, and he's shining a, you know, he's shining a light on it and making us, and I thought, you know, he came up with, you know, some kind of good points in there about like, hey, it could be, should be 100% the woman's choice, but if it's 100% the woman's choice, the guy has 100% choice to walk away too, you know, it's like, you you can't have these two, you can't have these two things where, and it's like, when he puts it like that in a joke form, you kind of, you look at it from, you take your own emotion out of it a little bit and you see it like a bit more objectively. Yeah. Um, And I do, I think like the, I think like mil- the the whole kind of like the veteran military com- community needs a big fucking dose of being able to laugh at itself a bit more because Jesus Christ, yeah. talk about a group. It's, a, it's just we're a pretty entitled bunch too, man. Fuck you, yeah. right now it's pretty ugly. Yeah. I, I, I just say that straight up, man. I, I I love I love my fellow war fighters, man. I love the vet community, mm-hmm. uh, but I fall into the trap too. You know what I mean? Because people shower us with love because they're guilty from the way people were treated in Vietnam. Mm. Uh, and it's like overcompensating and then we it, it, we're building up this image in our head that we're all like these great heroes and it's like uh, we're just not yeah. you know what i mean we're people that made we're a decision we did some we yeah. did and we did some a lot of us did some some crazy stuff some you know acts of heroism acts of bravery but that doesn't mean like just everything i did over there or everything that i'm about or the reason i joined is because i'm some like yeah. Uh, incredible person yeah. a lot of us were just like we had no choice oh, you know wanted, what i mean just wanted to fight yeah it's true. Like it's like if you would you would have fought anybody. Well, and there's yeah. a lot of people that go over there, and you know maybe in a in a tough situation you're behind the gun and you don't know what to do, and maybe you shot the wrong person at some point. Bro, right? uh, let's be honest as well. There's a lot of people who deliberately shot the wrong person. That's true. Exactly. That's a great point. So then we're back here though, and like I'm not condoning um, excessive force by police officers in any way, mm-hmm. but there are definitely situations where someone. Maybe didn't have enough training, um, mm-hmm. or made it made a bad decision. People make bad decisions, you know. Made the wrong choice, and it's like ruining their life and the entire brand of the, the police force is just tarnished. Like cops are bad, cops are mm-hmm. evil, cops are out to get you. But it's like in the military, everyone's like, oh, "No, y'all are heroes, though." I'm like, yeah. "What's the difference?" Just because well, we're in a different yeah, country. Well, I tell you, the difference, bro, is um, rightly or wrongly, like one of the one of the things about being in the military is you dehumanize the enemy, right? Whereas, so like a cop. The violence that, say, a cop would, I'm not saying rightly or wrongly, but a cop will at times have to use violence. And when they do, it's against someone who is of their own community, of their own country. Whereas when you commit violence, like, let's say, um, let's say you heard a, a story about a time where we've, we've all heard these stories. We've seen these stories. Um, somebody maybe uh, on a machine gun opened up on a car, turned out it was full of, it was full of a family. Now... Because they're from a different nationality, they speak differently, they look different, you know, they live on the other side of the world. Oh, well, that's just how it is at war. You know, people just, yeah, well, it's damage. just one of those collateral yeah, yeah. damage. No, no problem. Whereas if, imagine a police officer in that same situation just shot up a car full of people. Well, it's the same thing that they, they might have had reasons to believe that there was. They might have felt threatened. They might, yeah. have felt, might have felt threatened and all this stuff. But with the soldiers, it just gets, hey, no, no problem. Just get, carry on, go back to work the next day. Um, and I think that's like a real problem. I think with the military, is um, I do I do think as well like being being in the British forces, you know, we do have we did have stricter rules of engagements. I think we probably ended up with less of these, from you know anecdotally what I hear. Honestly, we did in the special forces too. Yeah, pretty it's very strict. strict because they know well, you're highly trained. And you should be able to decipher yep. and make those better decisions. So we did have higher yep. standards, and like and like that stuff didn't. I was fortunate. My team, my guys, that stuff never happened. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I never was in a situation yep. where. We we you know we we may have killed the wrong guy. Yeah. You know what I mean. There was definitely situations where I almost I, I literally almost shot somebody. Remember I remember it clearly because it's kind of haunt me forever. I'm glad it didn't happen, mm-hmm. but I almost shot somebody who was a he was a bad dude, but he was unarmed. Mm-hmm. And you don't you don't you don't shoot people that are unarmed. You yeah. just don't. You know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought he was because it was dark and there was a you know muzzle flash from across a rooftop coming from his direction. 
Turns out it was our partnered force, Iraqis just shooting up in the air, being an idiot. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know. So yeah. when he was running, he's running at me. Yeah. And I saw this muzzle, muzzle flash. I'm like hanging on the corner of a roof, you know, standing on a railing three stories up with my, you know, and I fired back because it's like I, I'm fearing for my life. This guy's coming at me mm -hmm. and I'm and, you know, I, I missed, thankfully. Yeah. You know, and, but then he, j he jumps off the freaking roof and, you know, goes down to three stories down, just shattered his legs. He, I, <laughs> I'm sure he didn't make it. But it was like I felt super guilty because I was like, uh, you know, but yeah, I, at the end of the day, like. <laughs> In that situation, there was no way I could have. Yeah. If anybody was in my shoes, I would say very few people would not have done the same thing. Yeah. And that gives, but that gives you empathy towards the police, because um, and again, it's like one of these things of like, there's nothing um, cut and dry about any of these situations, no. right? So, just because, like, if I say I, I feel like a lot of the times cops get a bad rep, that doesn't mean I'm not saying there aren't any racist cops exactly. or there aren't bad cops. No, there's bad of cops. Course there are. There's a ton there, of bad there's, cops. There's, there's a ton of shitbags in the military. There's too. a. I was going to say because I've said before, if you are a shitbag, the best place for you to join is the military because you will you will get <laughs> rewarded for being a shitbag. Where else can you call someone a fucking cunt and scream in their face and make their life misery and get paid for it? Like, there's nowhere else. Like, you will be rewarded for being that piece of shit who wants to bully people. And I've seen it every time I've gone on tour. There's, they, there's the ones of cre they'll creep out. They're the ones who will, you'll know that they're taking warning shots at civilians. You know, you'll see that they're, they're, they're the ones who are, um, they'll, they'll kill cats and dogs. You know, and that kind of thing. Fucking psychos. Yeah. And they exist. Oh, yeah. There's at least in, There's a in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a company, like let's say you've got a company, 100 guys, you've got at least two or three fucking psychos in there. Wait, there's, there's so much more of an emphasis on uh, passing passing the ASVAB test than there is a psyche valve. Yeah. Coming in, you know what I mean? It's yeah. a big emphasis. Like, well, you know, this guy, he's, 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 he's sound of mind, but he's just not so good at... Um, you know, engineering. Mm -hmm. So I just don't know if he's the right guy. I mean, yeah. you could have a guy that's just a genius, but he's, you know, a psychopath. Yeah. You're like, dude, and this dude, guy's like, scores are so high, though. Yeah, a lot of these guys are joined as well. Like, I'm not, I'm not, again, it's not necessarily laying the blame at their feet. A lot of them have had traumatic childhoods, you know, like but really. For sure. A like, lot really of bad. Like, lot, most know. people, that, and I think I'd say most people in America are running to the military. There's a mm -hmm. lot of guys and girls that grew up very patriotic, knew that was what they were going to do. But if I were to go through my basic training, my, uh, you know, my platoon and basic training, I would say way more of the people, it was like not always something they necessarily wanted to do. It was something they were interested in. Um, but for a lot of people, it was a last resort. And a lot of people, it was a great opportunity and a great option. Like, hey, I'm going to go get, co I'm going to get college paid for. Um, I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to learn structure and, pr and, you know, have a purpose and all these things. Like, it's more selfish reasons than uh, patriotic reasons. Oh, yeah. And again, it can be a bit of both. It can, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be this one or the other. Mine honestly but, was was a bit of both. Yeah. I mean, so I'll go back to yeah, yeah. So, talk, so, talk us for you. So nine eleven happened when I was twenty years old, and I was living in L.A. Um, Did you hear about it on Sports Center? No, <laughs> my mom actually called me. I, so I lived in this tiny little studio um, up on Gower and Franklin Street, in uh, I guess that's East Hollywood, sort of uh, near the ho below the Hollywood sign, like that area, and I was living up there. It was by, I want to say five thirty six in the morning, something like that. It was very early out here when the you know towers got hit, the first one anyway. And my phone rang, and it was my mom. So my dad gets up. My dad's a racehorse veterinarian. My dad oh, gets a racehorse up, veterinarian. Yeah, he gets up or at least used to. He doesn't quite get up as early now, but he used to get up, uh, you know, quarter five every day, do his exercises in the living room, make some coffee, have a bagel, head off to the track, right. So I, I'm, I'm assuming he had the, you know, the news on or something, TV on, and or, or heard on the radio or who knows what, and uh, that this happened. So my mom calls me, I answer the phone. She's like, Nate, turn on the TV. I was like, what channel? And she's like, any doesn't matter, just turn it on. And I turn it on. It's like, you know, you see a smoking tower, yep. and it was just like, whoa. Um, what I remember the most about that day was that evening out in the streets there was like these patriotic parades in LA people dressed head to toe in like American flag gear like really? dressed up like Uncle Sam like, it was really cool you know what I mean to see that sort of like us really coming together and um, I was really proud of that because I wasn't necessarily a super patriotic person uh, I didn't like dislike my country I just didn't care you know what I mean I yeah. took it for granted um, and so I started to 
get out of my comfort zone a little bit, started traveling. Uh, ended up going, uh, went with my family over to Ireland once, and then I backpacked through uh, most of Western Europe just by myself, sleeping on the trains and in hostels and whatnot. And then a uh, year after that, I ended up going to the Darfur and did some relief work over there in uh, in Western Sudan, Eastern Chad. And that, like, that was what really changed me because I'd read in this Time Magazine article about uh, the Dar- the, the, uh, the people of the Darfur. 300,000 had been murdered already, right? And there was all these refugee camps popping up. It was essentially this John Jaweed militia was rolling through these villages, raping the women, killing the men, you know, taking some of the children off to be child soldiers, burning the villages to the ground and moving on simply because... Um, you know, a different tribe, different God, maybe like stuff like that. And it was just, I just couldn't believe that was happening in 2004. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so I called every NGO to try to get over there. And all of them said, Hey, you don't have college degree. You don't have any special skills. Like, what are you going to do? And I was like, I don't know, but you guys are understaffed. Like I'm reading about it. Mm -hmm. I'll go do whatever. I'll go help build refugee campsites and assist in medical centers, whatever. You know, I work with autistic kids here in LA. Like, I, I can play with kids, or, or I don't, there's got to be something mm-hmm. um, that you need help with. You, you know, and uh, they were like, "Well, it's just not that simple." And I was like, "Screw that." Well, that's why you. Have, that's is. why you're fucking struggling for people in the first place. Cause exactly, they make it so yeah, fucking hard. Exactly. So I just flew over there anyway. Uh, I, I, I applied for a visa, and they gave me one, like a 60 day travel visa. And so I just flew over there. Um, when I got on the ground in the capital of Chad, I was like still you know several hundred miles from the darfur uh but i i i bs my way onto a un flight flew out to the refugee camps um with these other most like local aid workers and talked my way into a job there for you know the 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 month and a half or so that i was out there at the camps and it uh completely changed my life man just the opportunity to like not only like be of service as people say like you know, in a corny way, I feel like, but it was more about uh, perspective, you know, and appreciating how grateful those people were that an American would leave what we have here to go over there. They were just like astounded that I would do that, you know, and they wouldn't let me, I I mean, this family, a family would put me up for a time or I would like sleep at the refugee camps, like on the ground underneath the stars with these people. Um, And everywhere, I just felt so welcome. And I felt like, purpose really purposeful for the first time you know like I just was at home and part of it was like people just the gratitude for for just showing up and doing what you could but also um I didn't have a great image of myself and so like that austere environment I felt suited me because I felt like I was a dirt like a dirt bag I just yeah. wasn't I wasn't very valuable you know what I mean and I was like well no one values these people so I fit in right. you know what I mean yeah, yeah, it makes sense. and uh so it was like it was just interesting I mean the cultural and language barriers were super prevalent um I play soccer with the kids every day uh help pass out food rations you know help build those help build this, the campsites that were growing like crazy you know digging ditches like just doing a uh, hard labor to be honest and it uh man it it just i was so i was so proud to be there and I, and I became very proud to be american because of that the way that they looked at us and like what we stand for like mm. the hope that this country does have for a lot of people you know and i know there's a lot of people that will disagree with that say like no we don't have hope for everybody and whatever but this is this is a, this is the place that supports underdogs like we we always pull for for the person that has less of a shot if we don't have a dog in the fight you know what i mean we want the underdog and uh it's not like that everywhere a lot of times you know you have to be bo- you're born into a certain name um then if, if you're not born with that name you have no hope yeah. here you obviously have more advantages maybe if you're born into yeah, a certain family yeah, for sure but you can still become like, again, anything it's not cut and dry like 100 no. percent no. that you have a much like the, you know, like uh, you know, the guy coming up to the presidential race recently, Mike Mike Bloomberg spent like half a million on advertising and stuff like that. You That's know, it? half half a billion, sorry, yeah, yeah. half a billion on advertising. He has a better shot of becoming a president than you than you would do because of his wealth. That's that's a fact. But the fa- but in theory, you could become president. You know, it's and there's not many places. Um, there's not, like apart from like a few places in Europe and stuff. There's really not that many places. Most places, if you want to be anybody and become an important person, you usually have to do it through crime or violence. 
if you look in Mexico, for instance, you know, which we're, we're, a couple, we're a couple of hours from Mexico here, which is crazy. We're like literally a couple of hours away. If you want to get into the upper echelons of power there, then you're probably going to have to do it violently, you know, and through, through crime. And um, this is one of the few countries in the world where you can be legitimately kind of, you know, the, the social mobility is a lot better. That doesn't mean that there's not massive problems with it still because there are, right. you know, it's not a level, it's not a level playing field. No. I don't think you can, I, I don't well, people always talk about the lesser of two evils. I don't know how many countries there are in the world. There's hundreds of them, but this is the lesser of hundreds of evils mm -hmm. in my opinion. <laughs> like, yeah. no, you know what I mean? 100%, it's right. not perfect. It is a mess. Mm -hmm. We've got so much to work on. We can always do better, but it's yep. still, it's mm -hmm. still my favorite. Yeah, no, I do. I, I, I love it over here too. Don't get me wrong. There's a few things I change and I'd love for sure, and I, I you love, can be anything. Yeah, here. I you love, can't be anything everywhere else. No, and I I actually get pissed off when I'm over here about how ungrateful some people are to be American because, as much as I love the UK, you know, with me wanting to work in the arts and stuff, you know, so when I'm over here now, I can't I can't work while I'm in the states. I would be so much further ahead in my career if I was be if I happened to have been born in America, and I could have just come to come to LA, worked a job, driven a fucking Uber or whatever and got into you know because i had to take you know i i've had to you know try to try and make it to try and make it and you know i've done pretty well now but to try and make it from wrexham north wales where there's not really much of an entertainment scene but can there's there's not really the option of going anywhere like in america if you're born in fucking omaha or somewhere you can move to you know you can move to new york you can move to LA and you know you've got all these different opportunities like you've got a whole continent to choose all these different opportunities from so I get pretty pissed off when I hear people complaining about it in the states I'm like if you don't like it where you are you can fucking move like you can if you don't like California you can move to Denver if you don't like Denver you can move to fucking Seattle or whatever there's all these different places you can move I don't believe that you can't find a niche for you and if you're born in America that there's not going to be somewhere that fits you perfectly I don't believe that there's yeah. so many fucking choices I agree all right, I there agree, you go. Man. Tourism board. Sound, I'll, ta I'll take my check <laughs> now. Thank you, California Tourism Board. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's true, dude. And um, I, you know, I know you and I are very big on on continuing. You know, like make making change happen yourself rather than expecting it to come to you. So it's like, oh, I don't like the laws in California. Well, if you like the ones in Texas, better move to fucking Texas. Yeah. Don't expect things to change around you. Fucking move yourself. And this is something I'm going to offer on a little rant now. One of the ones that you know, like most people's parents or, or not parents sorry grandparents generation plus used to move to where work was and now there's this thing in like so in wales especially like in south wales you know people move to the valleys for the coal mines because people weren't living in the valleys before they only moved there because that's where the coal was so these towns grew up based around coal, you know the coal mines so you've got very small houses nothing else going much going on there and then now the people there are going like because there's no work there they're like, oh, well, the work needs to come to us. These are our homes. So they're only your homes because it was your grandparents' workplace. Now, there's fucking, there might be a, a business fucking business park 50 miles away that needs people to work in a fucking telephone, uh, you know, like a telecom company or something. Move to them. Like, don't expect them to move to you. And this attitude, I think, is like this one of entitlement. It's like, again, you know. It's just with technology, dude. You know, things become so much easier, and so we don't have to work for anything. I mean, that's – I just recently been developing this uh, this pod path, podcast project with History Channel, right, and sitting down with World War II vets and them – Is that the one you did with Tim and Jesse? Stories. Yeah, exactly. Shout out to Tim and Jesse. Yeah, shout out to Tim and Jesse. But uh, just to hear – I mean, the, it's all humble beginnings, and then they go back to humble begin humble endings. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, they come back from war – Talk about like heroism. More people died on Iwo Jima than the entire mm -hmm. global war on terror, uh, American wise. Mm -hmm. And and that was a five week battle and that wasn't even like the bloodiest of the bloodiest on a two by four mile island. You know what I mean? Yeah. And these guys came back and what they do? They went to work. A lot of well, them went well, to work in jobs like that. They didn't have a choice. Exactly. They didn't have a choice. Come back. But here it's like right. you come back and everyone, if you're not 100% with the, with, the, mm -hmm. with the VA, everyone, they're, you're pissed off. You're like, well, I should be 100%. I got PTSD. I got this, that. They're like, everybody's got it, man. PTSD, yeah. first of all, the D is dumb because post traumatic D. stress, it stands for dumb. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's abnormal circumstances. You're going to have an abnormal, abnormal reaction. If you don't, if you don't react uh, as far as like, feeling things like survivor's guilt, having dreams, nightmares, whatever you want to call it. If you don't have some of that stuff, if loud noises don't freak you out, if you came back from war and you were just like, I'm fine, 
that's nuts. Yeah, that's a psycho. <laughs> Something's wrong. But you know, with it, but there, oh, there's a few differences I think with the PTSD. It's, it's like, you know, when so when my granddad when he was in the bomber cruise, he knew when he was in danger. He knew when he wasn't. Right. So they'd be in the base in the UK, not in danger. They go up in the flight. You know, they go up on that mission. He knows he's in danger for the duration of that mission. And then they come back, not in danger. You know, I think that the one of the things that's been different about the wars of the war on the war on terror is that for the first time really in history you've been in theory constantly in danger for the entirety of deployment you could be attacked at any time regardless of you know you could just be eating your fucking your ration pack and fucking grenade comes over the wall you know there's never a time where you're fully not in danger and that's been very different to other wars because it used to be you go on campaign fight one battle and that would be it and the rest of the time you know you might have been on campaign for six months but you were only in danger once you know and then when you were in danger maybe that danger was incredibly these intense Evo, these Evo guys they were they were in guam and guadalcanal yeah i know, I know but, yeah, but i'm like getting well, that's, that's kind of what i'm saying but that's what i'm saying like that's that's kind of where things have been changing because the other thing like, i was going to say was different is you've got for the first time ever these guys would go away so in the second world war you join up and you'd go away and you'd go on campaign and you knew that you were like until the war was won that you were going to be doing these battles so you'd go to battle then maybe you'd go to australia for a few months and chill but like this we've the way the war on terror has been done is it's like these these wars are, are constantly going on but you'll go to them for six months or 12 months depending on what, you, what unit is then you come back for you then you go back, then you go forth, then you go back, then you go forth. There's never been an end in sight with it. And yeah, I think that, true. Uh, that like of going like that constantly back and forward and never being able to, you never fully like kind of like get back into one rhythm or the other. I'm, I've been, I'm a, I've said it before on this, I think it should have been that we went to these fucking places and stayed and everyone, people fucking stay there until the fucking job gets done. You know, the same way as we used to do in like World War II. Guys weren't fucking going there expecting to come back until the job got done. I think there's a lot to be said for that, but the way that it's also so different because we're not fighting a country. Exactly, it, it, it's all very different, dude. Yeah. But I think that there are like, you know, the you other know, thing you as mean, well. Is I these, mean, that these, makes sense. You know, the, guys, the tempo is totally different. Yeah, but the, the, all, every pretty much every war before this one, except for Vietnam, they're all like four years. Yeah, it's over. You know what I mean? You weren't having, yeah, you weren't having. There's guys now who have done like 20 years of going back, like 20 years of cons, like deploying every of, the, of every other year. It's, you know, it's nuts. I mean, there's some guys out there like did 10 tours, but they do like, you know, like the Ranger guys, they do like short tours. Yeah. But then there's like some guys, um, you know, like the US Army, they were doing like, what well, you, I don't know about you guys, but the, you know, some of those units were doing like, what, like 13, 14 months? You know? Yeah. I think the longest was 18 that I ever heard. I mean, it might have been even up to two years. Yeah, but it was definitely 18 months for a bit. Yeah. And they'd get, they'd go back for, you get a t two weeks in the middle of 18 months. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. But the longest one I ever did was about nine or 10. Right. And that was plenty long. So <laughs> you went in as, uh, was it 18 X Wing? Mm hmm. So just explain to the yeah. British, British listeners. So, real quick, I'll, I'll, finish want, the, I'll finish up the, I'll finish up the Africa thing because okay, so. that leads into it. So my last week in the Sudan, or in the Darfur, I should say, uh, I got malaria. And, I was like put up by this family and they were taking care of me. They were trying to feed me. I couldn't keep anything down though. I mean, it was like uh, basically three days of just like the worst flu you can possibly imagine. Corona. Uh, corona. I think it's way worse than that. The symptoms. Does that make you feel better about the fact that you have going to infect Corona? No. I yeah. So. I feel like my immune system is very strong because I had malaria. And I, yeah. you know, so we'll see. It's three days in and out. We'll see. Uh, and so, this is the Nate Boy Memorial episode. <laughs> <laughs> you better get it out by Monday so I can hear it before I die. Uh, and so, they, they, yeah, they, they did that, and they put me in this – they quarantined me. <laughs> they put me in this room on this cot and had a little radio uh, next to me, and it was a, there was a Bob Marley cassette tape in the radio, right? So I listened to Bob Marley on both sides three times, and I was freaking sick of Bob Marley. So I start flipping through, trying to find a station, and the only one that came through was the BBC. Yeah, and shout uh, out BBC, shout Actually, out BBC. Fuck, no, I'm not shouting out BBC. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking dude. So it was Big a news, it was a woman, woman, British woman's voice reporting, and it was during the Second Battle of Fallujah. So I'm listening to the Marines, mm. you know, go in and, um, you know, fight for these people, fight for those people that can't fight for themselves. And I just like felt that that pull in the moment. I don't know if it's because I was hallucinating and sick and a mess 
but I just knew I was going to come back and join the military. So I came back to the States, ended up finding about the 18 X-ray contract, which is uh, basically uh, for the Army Special Forces, you would come in off the street, go to basic training and airborne school, and then you go to a pre-selection course. If you pass that, it's a month long, and it's actually the, the attrition rate was maybe higher than regular selection, but it was all people like me, people that weren't prior service military. You're doing like long distance land navigation. Um, they're basically just beating the crap out of you for a month, not physically, literally, but uh, um, just putting you through the ringer, man. And, and people are people are quitting or not making time standards and they're washing out. If you get through that, then you go to selection with the rest of the regular army guys, special forces assessment selection. And that's three weeks long. And if you pass that, then you start your roughly year to year and a half long training to be a Green Beret. And so I did that. I mean, in basic training, I was like so weak when I got there because I didn't train at all. I wasn't a fitness guy. I just, you know, rolled my own cigarettes and, mm. you know, drank too much and didn't really care. And and I just had turned, uh, I was 23, I think it turned 24, just turned 24, something like that. Uh, so I was a little bit older. Uh, and I also, I knew, I really knew what I wanted. I knew because of the special forces motto was depress they oppress a bear. The mission What's which means mean? which means to free the oppressed, I'm sorry. Which means to free the oppressed. I just assumed everybody in Britain speaks Latin. Is that <laughs> wrong? <laughs> well, well we're not a hogwarts, we push up on it there. Uh and also it was like the mission, you know, it's partnered you're working with partners forces. Everything you do is by, with and through Afghans, Iraqis, no matter where you are. And that was interesting to me because of my time just spent in the Darfur. You know what I mean? And so I just, I knew I wanted to be a Green Beret. It was that or bust. And because of that mentality, I outworked everybody around me, you know? Because when I got to basic training, like I said, I was in bad shape. I, I think on the first PT test, I did like 29 push ups and 53 sit ups and ran two miles in like 15 minutes, which is not good. It's disgusting. It's terrible. Yeah. And I weighed about 150 pounds. Oh my God. And then by the end of basic training, I did 145 push ups in two minutes. Yeah like 105 sit-ups and ran two miles in under 11 minutes. So like completely transformed over 14 mm -hmm. weeks because I just worked my ass off. I did extra shit all the time. If we had any free time, I would take my body armor, go down to the track and just like do a lap. Of, like, no, I did a mile of lunges one time, just straight lunges for a whole mile, four laps, yeah. which is horrible. I know it sounds so bad yes. right now, <laughs> but I just knew I was like, I was mentally conditioning myself more than anything. Yep. If I can just do this, like there's nothing that will stop me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll be fine when I get out there. It will never, I never wanted it to be, um, you know, a physical incapability that, that stopped me from making it. It was going to either be because I'm just not mentally ready or, um, if you get an injury or something. Yeah. Or I'm just not picking it up quick enough. Cause yeah. I'm, cause I'm a new guy off the street. I'm mm -hmm. like, that would be, I, I could have lived with that. Yeah. But if it was that I wasn't prepared physically or even, I guess mentally, that's not a good way of putting it. Mentally prepared in that sense, mm -hmm. as far as the toughness sense, there's no excuse for that. That's all up to me. You know what I mean? I'm not, I don't necessarily get to choose how fast of a learner I am, but, uh, I get to choose how hard I work. Yeah, everybody look, has that some choice. Some people are more um, like it's like athletics. It's, uh, same with athletics. There's some people who can you can be really fit, but some people just don't have say the gift of like the touch of like so you know the um, throwing throw an American football around. You know, it's like a lot of it is just like this. It's like this kind of. The, the judging distances and being able to like make just arm strength when you see too. Some, yeah when yeah. you see some people play um sports you know some people create space out of nothing no matter how big they are they just move gracefully mm -hmm. so you might have someone that's really fit but some people with like i've seen it with soldiering some people like they'll doesn't matter how much training they get they'll never look like the weapon is a part of them it's they're always like they're like it's like watching an old person with a laptop or something you know but then there's other people who you can just see that weapon is part of them. Their, their drill, uh, their drill, their drills are graceful, and it's like you know, it's like watching a, a bit of violent ballet. Oh, violent, pa violent ballet is what it's like. But you know what I mean. So like, I get what you're saying. Like, yeah. there's some people just, some people just aren't like. There's not that natural affinity towards right. it. Like, some people don't get music. Totally. Some people can never make music. It's the same with soldiering or whatever. Some people are more prone, uh, or sorry, more people more uh, just have this kind of like. I think a you know, a natural kind of, you know, gift towards it. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. I definitely didn't. I had to work, I had to work yeah. you know. I mean, like, I was I was always a decent athlete growing mm -hmm. up. Played a lot of sports, but I was never the star. You know what I mean? I was, yeah. like, I was usually a starter, but not, like, the guy. Isn't that what you get a lot of in the infantry and special? Because I, I say quite a lot that, like, um, 
you know, especially infantry, infantry guys, special forces guys, uh, athletes who weren't good enough to go pro. Yeah, a decent amount probably. Yeah, yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, I haven't really feel, thought of it like that. A lot of them, use it. a lot of them are not. <laughs> Some of them, yeah. like, how are you <laughs> sloppy bodied, like knock knee, <laughs> yeah. awkward as hell? Yeah. I'm like, how is this? Person? It's like watching ta- watching but Tyson they work Fury. There, but, but most of those guys, Fury the week, if you looked at him body wise, no. but like guys, he, are supreme, I'm sure he works his ass he's, off. Though. Exactly, he's you a know? supreme athlete, but he yeah. just has a dad bod, <laughs> like, and he just and is an well, absolute guys and is an absolute killer. Some of these guys, no matter how hard they work. They limp across that finish line on PT mm. test or a long ruck march just in time, mm. but they made it. You know, they made the time standards. They find a way, but they're good at other things. Those are a lot of times, like one of our medics when I was deployed. You know, he was he was a stellar medic. He just was in shit shape. You know what yeah. I mean? But when it came down to like being on the battlefield, like that's the dude you want. Yeah. You know, there's also like we always, there's always the the fit fat guys. There's yeah, some guys true. who are always fit, like how are you, you don't, running you don't that know, fast? You don't know how they do it, but they'll never fail any fitness test. They'll yeah. never drop out of anything. And this is fat as fuck, and they eat shit. <laughs> like those guys exist. Yeah, and they, those are the guys when they get out of the military, they just bl- like you'll those see. Those are probably you'll, the guys you'll... who almost made it to the pros but didn't. Yeah, you know, you'll, like you'll that see... guy's like a middle linebacker. Yeah, or something. you'll see him a year or two later, and they'll just be they'll be huge because like now they don't need to do because like they'll be the people who they never choose to go and do their own PT. Right. It's always just if they have to, and right. then once they get out and they don't have to do it anymore, boom, the fucking balloon, <laughs> boom. <laughs> Yeah. That's the word. So, the, well, okay, I've got. So, obviously, this idea of joining special forces direct is not something that would be familiar to British listeners because we don't do that. You know, you've got to, you've got to have served. Well, that, one. that only so, came about, I think, in two thousand and three, and it was kind of during, des- during the surge. Desperate, desperate yeah, for needed more numbers. bodies, and they'd done it in the past. They did it. They did it in Vietnam as well. Right. And part of it is, um, you're losing guys. That is a legit part of it. Uh, it's not the biggest part though. The biggest part they want to bolster the unit, and they want to be able to give some of those guys respite that are on those back to back deployments, you know? So they, the idea was we're gonna, we're gonna uh, build another battalion within, within each special forces group. They had three battalions, we're gonna make a fourth. So to, to jump those numbers up, um, they didn't wanna lower the standards. Um, so, and they wanted to have regular army, army guys in as well, but also part of it is they knew there was, a, they know there's a lot of people out there on the streets that are gonna join the military because of 9-11, because we're at war, because the surge is happening, we're sending more troops to Iraq, more troops to Afghanistan. So we're going to get the types of people that typically wouldn't join the military because, I mean, they're freaking, they got their sights set on Wall Street or something. Yep. You know what I mean? And now they're joining uh, because of the current state of affairs in our country and, and uh, more patriotic reasons. And maybe these guys are not only like in good physical shape, but they, they're they outside the box thinkers. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They're looking at things a different way. They've had to live out on their own for a while uh, after high school, maybe, they, you know, or college degree. Or whatever it is. Would you say they're older? A lot of them were, yeah. I think when they initially started, I think you had to be 21. Nice. And then they dropped that to like 19 and then down to 18 eventually. But um, but still, like it was encouraged. Like If you had uh, any college credits, if you were a little bit older, um, and then you, you would take more than just the ASVAB. You took like a psyche eval, language aptitude test, all these things like that. You had to pass with certain marks on that. You know, they, they wanted to see how quick you pick things up yeah. and looking at things differently, thinking of things differently. So that was part of it just to get that contract before you went to basic training. And that was essential, man. And, and, and there was a lot of 18 x-rays. Initially, of course, understandably, the regular Army guys just hated us, mm-hmm. you know, because this is like, I mean, part of it's maybe. They feel like you haven't paid your dues. Part of it, yeah, exactly. Part of it, part of it I was going to say, is maybe jealousy of the opportunity, mm. but also part of it is like, we don't know what the hell we're doing. Dude, yet. I'm fucking we, we jealous of it. You know? I, I'm jealous of that opportunity. But a lot of it, too, is like, yeah. to their point, like, we don't know what we're doing. It takes a bit mm. to figure it out, the military. Yeah. The military, you don't just like, you don't change it. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to come in and like, we're changing the game here. We're doing it different. Yeah. It's not going to be like that. So, you know, the. Um, scrutiny whether we're going to be able to adapt and a lot of guys didn't do very well and that's understandable i mean i had plenty of guys when i was going through the q course that i knew just just didn't like me because i made fun of everything you know i didn't always have the best military bearing <laughs> but that's just <laughs> that's just who i am and there were certain guys that were regular army though before that that loved that about me because it was just it was different it was refreshing in some ways you know what i mean um, but i know i pissed a lot of people off and i hope most of those people i made amends with but I just had a, I, I, I just carry myself in a different way, man. I, I'm, I have a very dark sense of humor, which a lot of people in the military have anyway. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I uh, that's how I get through stuff. But man. I think I in America, more so than the UK, you get, um, you got some people who are just like, 
honor, dignity, respect. And, and like, it's like, no, you must honor the uniform at all times. And like, if you make a little joke about things, they take it like, it's like, it's like if you made the joke about the mother, you know, and they, they just, I think there's that kind of like, um, they can't disassociate and just see as something is a, yeah. is, a, is a joke. It's it's such a it's like the beyond patriotism thing because yeah. it's one thing to love your country and stuff, and then there's another to like it's just and we, we and we man. see it a lot. Like um you know it's one of all right. We'll jump in like jump into this now because there's something I wanted to bring up with you. I noticed when that whole that Eddie Gallagher thing happened. Oh yeah. The the there were people who would just not accept the fact that an American could commit war or possibility. So, yeah, it was, so it was yeah, exactly. It wasn't like. It wasn't, is he guilty, is he not guilty? No, it was no matter like, what, he's a seal, he's a hero. Yeah, and I was, was like, like, I was like, right, I, yeah, I, couldn't, I couldn't get my head around that. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know the guy. I don't being. know the story he's that He's a human well. being. Yeah. As a human being, he has the capability for good and evil, like we right. all do. Every single one of us. We've all fucking made mistakes. He might have been a great guy who made one mistake one day. Right. You know, like there's all these different possibilities. That's just our country. But it was though, just dude. like, uh, but yeah, but that's what's That's one of the big issues here. It's like, we take a side. Everyone wants yeah. to do is take a side. It's like, you know, we're all for him or all against him. And the th same thing happens when there is a police involved shooting, for mm -hmm. instance. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it's all, every one of those situations, just to people is black and white. You know, they demonize one side or the other. Yeah, yeah. Period. And they just do what they can to discredit. It's like politics. It's the same thing. I'm like, God, oh, we're pretty much all politicians when it comes down to those things, man. Yeah. We just want to sling mud, dig in and prove why we're right the other person's wrong it doesn't matter the facts the facts don't matter i i have a theory that America, no one does it with patience like, either they just do it immediate it's an immediate yeah. response it's like yeah. well, let's just see yeah let's just give it a yeah. second yeah the, you know? dude, I, I have a theory that america needs to be constantly at war because if it's not ill fall or it go to war with itself hmm. is my fear guys you look at it like there's not many periods where america hasn't been at war when it has it's been <laughs> like civil war yeah. um and now it's like really and i but like you said, it's like very much a team kind of thing. And it's when you... Oh, dude, we're a country full of winners. But, but you know it, what I mean? It's in our blood and it's like banged into our heads since we're a little kid. And it's... Well, it, it was. But I it's, don't but think it, it is anymore. It's still... It, it, well, you're right. With the... With the uh, trophy thing yeah i don't um, i don't think i don't think it is and and that's what again but that comes down to the side thing because it's very much i do think it was everyone was on that same sheet pretty much but now some people are for participation trophy like culture well that's because are not. that doesn't and, mean that doesn't mean they still want, want to be that, that that still means they want to be winners they just don't want to have any losers we can't afford to have any losers we don't want to call them yeah I, I i don't know dude i think like well, losing is great i think dude. there's a lot of like i think it's need to lose Look, not everyone is like the fact is we could just drive down the street now and we're gonna see a people a lot of people who are not winners, you know. Like that's just I'm the, sitting across from one right now. Yeah, fuck you, you're coming <laughs> on my podcast, not the other way around, <laughs> motherfucker. You came to me. That's false. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well let's just say I had some incriminating evidence about you and your aspiring porn career. Um but dude, it's it's I, I, I think that I think that America is like a, is a bit is a freak of nature in a way because it grew it happened so quickly and became like so like what where where is europe you know you developed over centuries and you have all these like states with national power you know they're national states in america you've got these states which really in a lot of ways are like different countries but because people have a common language and common history you know it's it's all one country but you know like what i've you know i've been lucky enough to bounce around american quite a lot i mean dude there's a big difference you're from northern california there's a difference between northern california and southern california yeah you know um and i i i, I just feel like um i don't think america is is going to be i f i don't think we'll see it in our lifetime but i'd be amazed if in 150 years america still looks like it does of does course now. it won't didn't yeah. look like this 150 years no, ago exactly but but I, yeah but, uh, it, but it won't but i and i think that's something that people should consider going through life because it's there's ways of doing things there's change is inevitable right so it's like how do you grease the wheels to make sure that it happens smoothly and peacefully it's impossible of them. well i don't know look what's happening with scotland you know with scotland and the uk i have no idea what's happening with scotland and the it's because you're american you don't look outside your own borders no it's exactly that's the the seven problem. people seven people unless you're gonna shoot people you don't seven people <laughs> Scotland's like South Dakota. No, it's, they, they had a couple of they had a couple of wee barons last year. They're up to nine, uh, but the, but yeah, I just I think it's again it's something like it, it's, you 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 can understand that, bro. I've said this to a lot. I've I've ran that point by a lot of Americans like no, it's impossible. I'm like well, it's not impossible. Every country every country changes changes shape, um, 
But I think it's one of the it's it's been one of the strengths. The I'm diverse, not saying it's impossible. I'm yeah. saying it's impossible to do it absolutely smoothly. That, yeah. That well, yeah. Exist. Sure. Anyway. But it, it's been one of America's strengths. The that that kind of like the, it, the, its size has been its strength and um, things. But I think as you know, there's this divergence now between more between the states. I think that um, um, yeah, I kind of think this days are numbered. Really, America's which is um, I don't think is a particularly good thing because. There's always got to be someone's got to be top dog in the world. And I was, gonna, you, I was I, just going to say, as America goes, so goes the world. Yeah, exa- exactly. Well, yeah, for now, because that's it's a rotation. Someone else will become top dog. And you don't really see any contenders that you would necessarily consider benevolent, you know, right now. You know, it's kind of like the last several presidential elections. Yeah. You know, what do you mean? Ah, there's just lesser two evils or 17 oh, yeah. evils or 50 evils or whatever. Yeah. Just n- nobody's been super super how, how, expanding how, how, to me one of the things i find interesting about the states dude there's nobody like i hear people talking about how the you know the two parties need to work together more and all that kind of stuff obviously all things are good. The two parties that's what we need to do well yeah that's what i'm saying like i don't you don't hear many people going like uh well why can't we get rid of these two parties and have a different fucking system like the idea that two parties represent the it's the, awful man that's the, why everything's black or right white yeah. red, red or blue you know one side or the other because every single major topic of contention is like if you're on one side you have to believe all those things they believe and if you're on the other side you have to believe all those things they believe you cannot be a free thinker you just can't be an individual like, which is ridiculous it's stupid like the idea that, you can, that the idea Trust that, me. so like you like if you talk to your group like anyone talk to their group of friends or family you'll have things that you'll agree on you'll have things that you don't agree on totally so the idea that you can have a fucking party that represents everything you think is nuts i mean again there's fucking clever unless people you there. genuinely believed all those things but there's no freaking way head to toe people just they're like well i, I you know i'm just gonna go this way because mm-hmm. that's the way my party goes yeah you know because we're stupid yeah but i i just think like there must be some way of like in this day and age of having a way of voting where it's like you vote on issues rather than for a single party and you you know that you can vote vote by vote issue by issue I'm not saying every issue either, because I think there's some things that just like look, just let, let the fucking experts take care <laughs> to get care of so, certain things. But if we, you know, if you if you had a a vote whereby you know you could say right, well, seventy percent of the nation feels this way about gun control, um, and then th- have that issue by issue rather than it being you've got to choose the Democratic or the Republican um, side of it, and then you know do things do things yeah. that way. I don't know, dude. I just want no, Skynet. I want Skynet to take over. I fucking <laughs> I've, I've, I've had enough of this stuff. It just seems like, like, so like that Mike Bloomberg thing recently, you know, 500 million, dump, just down the drain on advertising and then he drops out the race. I'm like, fuck, like, a lot of these issues that you're talking about as a candidate, you could have fucking solved one of them with that 500 million instead of buying fucking ads. Well, there was, I, I, and I don't know the, the accuracy of this, but I remember reading about. Doesn't matter, mate. We, we do not fact check on that's this. That's true. Show. Good. No one does. No one does anyway. People just hear things. They're like, it must be true. <laughs> Uh, they're like it was like roughly forty billion dollars. Which yes, that's a big number, but Zuckerberg has that. Mm. You know what I mean? Roughly forty forty billion dollars would, uh, at a fundamental level, solve the world's clean water, um, hunger, basic shelter, basic education, and basic medical care issues for everybody in the world. Like for, that's not that much. Yeah. I don't know if that's an annual number or whatever. It's still not that much. Like compared to, I mean, we're twenty trillion in debt. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, whatever. What's another forty billion? Yeah. So like, um, that's crazy to me. And 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 I and also, I mean, I don't think solve is probably a terrible word to use. I said solve. It would it would mitigate it or it would mm-hmm. put a band aid on it maybe right. Yeah. But at, at the same time, like, what's the most important thing in the world? I mean, yeah. What's the most important thing in the world? Like, is it? You know, can you pay your car off? Is it all these things? Or is it the people that are literally, you know, dying all over the planet, not before this coronavirus freak out? Now that it's personal and everyone's like mm-hmm. personally maybe affected, now everyone like cares. But, you know, what what about what about the rest of the world all the time? Well, dude, you that's know, what it seems to be saying. Constantly like, like dying from, you know, from hunger and disease yeah. and, 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 and like the clean water crisis, all these things. I mean, like you we, had, you we had, we talk like, about it and we do an event maybe and like yeah. whatever, but no one really gives a damn. Like, like malaria you had, right? How many people die of malaria each year? I have no idea, but I'm sure it's a ton. So it's got to be hundreds of thousands, isn't it? Probably. I have, I have but no like, idea. you know, there are these things, like you said, these things are out there killing people in droves and in, in constantly, like hunger. 
you know, constantly. And I think, um, you know, it's, uh, we have a very selfish look on it. And the, the other thing as well is something like this coronavirus that I never even thought of until today when I was just tuning in the radio for a little bit. It's because I'm from the UK. I just assume, oh, anyone gets sick, they go and get treatment, don't they? Well, it's not the case here. Because they were, they were, you know, they were, they were, I was listening on the radio about, they were talking about how they want to make it so that anybody that thinks they got coronavirus can get checked up and even if they've got insurance or not. And I was like, fuck, I hadn't even thought about that. That in America, like, you've got to have fucking insurance for, you know, for the whole thing. Right. I, and and it, do, it does blow my mind, like, in America that there's not, like, a universal health thing. Yeah, but thing. It, would be a, it would be a nightmare, dude. But, yeah, but it it just amazes me. This is one of st- one of those things where I think about, what is, yeah. I mean, I go to the VA. Well, yeah, you go. <laughs> and that's to a the, small, sec, small cross section of the country. You go to the VA, which I think. Is, but the, yeah, but the care is not the care is not very good, man. It's like tough. I'm not saying it's not. I'm not saying it's good, and I'm not saying that the NHS care is great everywhere. Right. But the fact is, it's there. You yeah. know, and to be honest, right, as an American, like I think, regardless of how you felt about your country, for the GI Bill and VA, it's worth doing a few fucking years. You could be a fucking pogue. Sure. You could just be a, get a pogue job, because I know people have said, oh, I thought about doing it for the v- VA. For the VA and GI Bill, but you know, I did want to get sent to war. Look, you're it's fucking not, it's not like you get free healthcare at the VA just yeah. out the door. It, it's only for pre not pre existing conditions. It's only for service connected issues. Right. I can't just go there because I don't feel well. You Can know, you I'm not? not, not no, if I get if Is I go there because I don't feel well and I get meds, I have to pay for them. Right. Yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? No, I didn't know. I can use the VA, mm-hmm. but like I don't get. Unless you're 100 percent disabled, you don't just get free healthcare. Right. Yeah. Okay. Out so the like door. You, it's only so, for it's so only for stuff that's related to you. So I, I go there for my back because I got jacked up back, um, and uh, you know other stuff. Whatever. Herpes. Post traumatic stress. <laughs> no, not that. Yeah, you you contracted herpes on tour. So it's, well, it's, uh, it's Jay Glazer claims that herpes actually cures the coronavirus. So. Did you really? No. Yeah, you just hear really. I was like, I'm not sure if I trust that. You're like, I'm good. Though. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> Today's podcast is made possible in part thanks to Frontier Risks Group, home of the world's leading practical training course in security risk management consultancy. Frontier Risks Group is an amalgamation of a number of leading companies in their field, guided by a team of equal experience and expertise in their respective domains. From security and crisis management, corporate risk, intelligence and analysis, compliance, workplace investigations, trauma response and training consultancy. If you are a veteran or if you will be transitioning out of the military, then you need to check these guys out, regardless of your rank or background. Some of Frontier Risk's former students now work as security risk managers, uh, advisors, travel risk managers, security analysts for some of the world's biggest organizations, such as Netflix, BBC, CNN, Deloitte, BAE Systems, Apple, and many, many more, including travel expert companies. Uh, You can learn more about Frontier Risks Group at FrontierRisks.com. That's FrontierRisks, one word, dot com. Check them out, guys. They're a fantastic company if you are looking for courses or if you're looking for careers or if you are looking for consultancy. Get over there. Check them out, FrontierRisks.com. This episode is also brought to you in part by Altberg Boots, specialist bootmakers who have been in the game for over 40 years. They make super alley boots. They make alley boots for civvies. All right, if you're a civvy, you might not know what alley means. It means cool. They make alley boots for civvies. They make alley boots for serving military. They make alley boots for cadets. If you've got a pair of feet, they make fucking boots for you, all right? So check them out. they got them in all kinds of different colors, all kinds of different fits, lightweight, heavyweight, whatever you want, bada bing, bada boom. Get some fucking Altbergs on your feet. I've used them for... Christ, I don't know. I'm old, right? I've used them for a long time. And um, yeah, you know, I'm a bit tight, but I put my hands in my pocket and bought a pair of Altbergs. Do you know why? Because they protect my ankles and they looked cool as fuck. So get yourself some Altbergs. Head over to altberg.co.uk. Alley boots on your feet. Let's do it. This podcast is made possible in part thanks to Zulu Alpha Strap Company. Bombers watch straps for alley blokes. It's a veteran-owned company, but you don't need to be a veteran to have a cool fucking watch strap to go with your timepiece. Uh, you might have spent a lot of money on it, on your watch, that is, so protect it. And even if you've got a shit watch, get one of these, and then you won't look like such a cheap fucker. Uh, you can see these watch- watches on the wrists of frontline operators around the globe. Where can you do that? At Zulu Alpha Straps. Go over there, take a look at some kinky pictures, then maybe even order yourself 
a strap you've got to All right, so let's talk about then what part of like unique to your story. I don't think anybody else has really done this. So there may be a couple other people, maybe. But the, your, you went from the military to professional sports. College sports first. Oh, okay. Well, that's part of the story, I guess, isn't it? So let, let's talk us through that. Keep in mind that British listeners won't understand the the um, the NCAA and stuff. Yeah, they so don't speak American. Yeah, we don't speak don't speak American. Don't we don't speak don't speak college slavery. Wow. Yeah. Well, they just canceled so, the NCAA tournament, so Bas- <laughs> basketball. <laughs> so now they don't get. Yeah. Now now they don't get. You're free. Any glory either. Yeah. <laughs> so go on. We talk us through. Um, yeah. So I was 28, turning 29, I guess. On, uh, I guess, no, I was 28 during my last deployment, during deployment to Iraq. I was 28 years old. Um, about halfway through the deployment, I remember I was up for um, reenlistment. And so I had like, a, I was like a year out, and uh, Team Sergeant asked me if I wanted to reenlist. You know, I should do it overseas because if there's a bonus, I get it tax free and blah, blah, blah. And I considered it. Um, Thought about it for a bit, but then also, so growing up, I played every sport, right? Almost every sport you can imagine, except for football. I never played football, and I regretted it because it was my favorite sport. Well, not, what was the reason behind not playing it? When I was really young, um, my mom didn't want me to play. Like You can start playing when you're like eight years old, which is probably a little young for kids to be banging helmets, especially back then, the way they were coaching it. You know? yeah, exactly it's like helmet. spearing each other, you know yeah. what I mean? Um, and... So I didn't do it then. And then by the time I was like in middle school, and I probably could if I wanted to, I was so into baseball and basketball. I was playing soccer as well. Football, or whatever y'all call it. I call it fucking gay. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> I like rugby. Uh, so, yeah. So I, I so I didn't do it because I was like, well, I won't catch up to these other kids. I wasn't very big either. And I wasn't, like I said, I was a decent athlete. I wasn't like a great athlete. If I was dominating at everything then I would have done it no issue but um, I was just really focused on baseball and basketball mostly and so then I get into high school didn't play there thought about it again like man I should try out for the team I should just do it and I just didn't I just chickened out man and I like regret I regretted it It was one of my biggest regrets is not playing football which is I know it sounds like ridiculous but I'm in my late 20s now and I'm like Mm. I still regret it still bothered me Mm -hmm. so I was like all right you know what I'm not gonna reenlist I'll, I'll transition into the National Guard and I'll I'll go back to college, try out for the team wherever I go. So fo- so football was a driving force in you going back to college. Yeah, yeah awesome. <laughs> to be honest, uh, I yeah, that's really it. About, I think I think sports is the coolest thing about the American college system. Um, I sorry, I think um, I think um, um, yeah, the co- the sports system in like the American colleges is one of the best things about college. Yeah, because it's like there's a lot of reasons. So you're saying you support slavery? Yeah. Wait, <laughs> there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of reasons to um, to not go to college now, but one of the things that offsets it, I think, is well, one, if you got a scholarship, which quite often comes through sports, but even like in the position of being a walk on, um, I think that that opportunity to you know to have that it's a great think, opportunity. Yeah, I think like if you are, you're not going to get that really anywhere else. You know, there's not there's not really mm-hmm. outside the professional sports. There's not really anywhere you can even the scholarships, man. Like. I mean, I know that's a very hot topic, mm-hmm. um, but you get you get your education paid for as an 18 year old kid. A lot of these guys wouldn't get into college, uh, or a college of that level, without the sport they played. And then you do get stipend. I mean, you get you make some money while you're there, so you can pay for whatever. So you don't have to get a job. Um, you can get you can you know get through. You can live while playing sports for the school and, and getting that education with potentially having hopes of playing professionally depending on the sport Mm -hmm. and that's that's really awesome man that's a rare thing you know Uh, because if it doesn't work out then you've got this potentially this great education from a university and and opportunities and job placement like hookups connections because of the sports that you play like it all it's a good deal how how much of that education is actually you know how much of that education is like let's say you're your division one athlete who's like a you know who's coming on a scholarship are they actually getting that education it's up to them man 
it's up to them. You got you got to be self motivated. I yeah. mean, like you got there's but I mean, plenty is it, of guys. Is it even? Is it even there's possible? tons of guys. Is it that, even possible with the amount of like? Yeah, you know. there's guys who got business degrees that were on scholarship. They got business degrees, went on to play in the NFL, mm -hmm. and then you know further did other stuff. There's yeah. um, one of the one of the, like this brilliant mathematician now that went to Penn State, John Urschel. Um, he played in the NFL for a bit, and now mm -hmm. he's like math whiz. Who knows what he's probably working for NASA or the NS or the, the NSA or something. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so it, it was a cool opportunity. Uh, you know, I was using the GI Bill to go back to school, and I just walked on, tried out for the team at University of Texas, and uh, just because of my work ethic, the shape I was in at that time. Even though I hadn't played, I didn't tell anybody that I hadn't played before. Mm -hmm. uh, I let that one. So what did you walk, did, when you go to walk on like these trials? Is there a particular position you're going for? Or are you just trying to get onto the squad? Yeah, at first you're just trying to get onto the squad um, because it's mostly conditioning. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they just they're running the hell out of you to make sure that you're gonna hold up because in their mind you're an asset to the team because you're gonna be on the scout team. You know what I mean? So you're basically gonna be a tackling dummy or a practice dummy right. for the starters to like. Yeah. You know, you 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 learn the offense or the defense of the team they're about to play the next week, mm -hmm. and then you do that during the week to give them a good look, you know, so they like kind of see some of those coverages if you're a quarterback receiver. Um, if if it's the defense, then you're running the other team's offense so they can see what type of stuff you do. And, you know, we study film. You study the other team's film, and then you like go pretend to be them, basically. And your job is to just get run over with dignity. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's pretty much what it is. And, uh, you know, but once in a while, one of those walk-ons – earns a spot playing maybe on usually on special teams or something like that and then eventually a scholarship and and sometimes you know they become i mean baker mayfield was a walk-on was he he was mm -hmm. yeah he had opportunities at smaller schools scholarship offers but he wanted to go to a big 12 school so he started out at texas tech walked on there earned a scholarship and then they started a different quarterback instead of him so he transferred to ou as a walk-on mm -hmm. walked on there earned a scholarship and then won the heisman trophy you know what I mean? Like, and then was the first pick in the draft. Like, crazy. Yeah. Um, so that's probably the greatest example, at least in recent history, of a walk-on that, like, truly made it. Um, but for me, I just – I'm not Baker Mayfield. I'm not a great athlete. Like, I'm a decent athlete. And so I was just uh, – at first, just happy to be on the team, happy that I made it. And then it was like, after that first season, I got to, I got to play in one game on Veterans Day. I got to run down on kickoff coverage. And just – the adrenaline, you know, hundred thousand people in the stands, yeah. and like, so I've, been, cause I've, been, I've been in that Texas stadium with you. So yeah. Like for people listening, we're not talking about because people listening they might not have an idea of the scale. We're talking about bigger than any stadium in the UK, packed. Yeah. And it's all home fans, right? Pretty much. Right. It's, yeah. It's not, yeah. It's, it's cool. It's a great it's stadium, insane. man. It's it's beautiful. It's better than most NFL stadiums, to yeah. be honest. So, I. Uh, I wanted to try to find a way on the field, you know. I, I caught the bug, not the coronavirus, the football, <laughs> like this, the playing bug, game day bug. And so I started uh, long snapping because the starting long snapper was graduating and his backup was graduating. And for those that don't know, long snappers basically, you know, on a, a typical play, there's the center who snaps the ball, hikes the ball through his legs to the quarterback to start the play. Well, every play except for kickoffs, is started by someone snapping it through their legs. On a punt or a field goal or an extra point, whenever it's a kicking play um, that's not kicked off a tee, the center snaps it a longer distance. The punter stands about <coughs> 15 yards or 13 and a half meters. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, French? I don't know, yeah. <laughs> from, the, from the center, the, the, the punter stands that far and you snap it through your legs and it's gotta be a, a spiral, you know, on a line you're trying to snap it right in their hip pocket and uh, then they kick the ball away on field goals and extra points it's seven to eight yards uh, you snap it to the holder he plants the ball on the ground and the kicker kicks it through the uprights um, so it's a specialized position and, and on punts after you snap it you have to block and then you run down and try to make a tackle on field goals and extra points you snap it and you just stand there and block and the, the you know the interesting part about doing it on field goals being my size guys you're bigger than I am I'm taller probably, but, uh, you know, you're, you got a bigger belly. Um, <laughs> but I'm not a big guy. I'm not a big guy. And, and I put some weight on to play in college. I put a lot on to play yeah. at the next level. But You say you went up to, oh, no. so In college, I was up to 
at the most probably about 200 but i was typically around 190 195 right. which is not very big no. and i'm standing next to 300 plus pound guys yeah. uh that are playing guard and tackle on my on my left and right helping me you know block and uh so i just i, I kept that that uh run over with dignity phrase in the back of my <laughs> mind because it was like as long as a kick doesn't get blocked mm -hmm. i win even yeah. if i get trampled you yeah. know what i mean but that's the goal take the charge like they do in basketball yeah. and uh but I started working on the long snapping, and, and, and in the summers, I was still getting deployed overseas through the National Guard. So I'd go back over to uh, – first couple years, I actually went over to Bulgaria and Greece on, like, peacekeeping missions with the Bulgarian and, and Greek special forces. And then the last two summers before my junior and senior year, I went to uh, Afghanistan hmm. both years. So I would bring a couple footballs with me, and I'd build a target out of plywood or something, and I would practice long snapping overseas during the summer. Uh, but that first year, when I went overseas, I told Mac Brown, who was the head coach then, and now he's the North Carolina head coach, I told him I wanted to try out for the long snap, or I asked him if I could try out for the long snapping position when I got back. And he said, uh, yeah, sure, you know, just be safe over there and come back. And I, I, in the back of his mind, he was just like, you're dreaming. <laughs> you know, like it's not going to happen. You're not going to figure it out in a few months. But I worked, I snapped 100 balls a day, man. I, I equated it to learning to shoot a pistol. I've never shot a pistol before I joined the military. Um, but I ended up being a pretty good pistol shot because I focused on all the little pieces of the movement. You know what I mean? From from drawing to putting it up in the box uh, to trigger squeeze to aim point, you know, all those little things uh, over and over and over, repetition, repetition. And with, with long snapping, it was like making sure I had that grip right. I would lay down on my cot when I had free time and I would just spin the ball above my head until I was like spinning spirals, you know? Yeah. And then I would go snap 100 balls a day into the plywood target, and it wasn't considered a successful snap unless it went through that the hole that I built. You know what I mean? Right, so you had to do 100, success, 100 successful ones. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, that was starting out, and it was like, it'd take a long time. Um, some days I didn't hit the mark because it's just <laughs> like the sun's setting, I got to go on mission or I got something to do. Um, but I just kept doing it. I just kept kept trying, um, focused on the spiral, focused on speed of the snap, focused on accuracy, trying different techniques. I was using YouTube videos and Googling like how to long snap and watching all these videos. Um, and eventually started to get decent hang of it. Came back that training camp and ended up winning the backup job through training camp, beating out about 10 other guys. First game of the year, they recruited this freshman kid to come do it. You know, really nice kid, but Doing something in front of 100,000 people was hard, it's, you know, yeah. challenging. And he didn't have the best game that first game, so I got to start the next game right. and ended up starting 38 straight for the rest of my career. You got to take your shot yeah. I mean, when you get it. Yeah, exactly. You know I mean, like you get – that's the thing. You might not be in the front and the back in order, but you need to be ready to step up and do the next person's yeah. job. In, and that goes for anything. It's like, in, you know, if it's – whatever because these these opportunities when they come along you have to be ready because they will come along there's always going to be times like right now like let's make a making joking apart by the coronavirus there's going to be some people that working from home now because a lot of offices are kicked out there's going to be some people that slack off go out drinking or drink at home and you know phone it in and there's going to be other people who take this opportunity to you know maybe shine and like the, and and when they come back into work, they'll have might have cemented themselves a new position, you know, right. through this. Yeah, you know, and it's you got to be ready for those for those chances and take them when they come along. What, what's it like? How, what, what was your kind of method of keeping like so? Like you said, in front of a hundred thousand people, um, like doing what you were doing. There's a lot of pressure on that, you know. Like literally, every set of eyes is on you, and if you fuck up, everyone's going to know about it. How did you deal with that kind of pressure? Well, I mean, the the repetition and preparation helps a lot. When you do it so many times that it becomes mechanical, mm -hmm. you don't have to think about it, right? Yeah. So when I'd, when I'd sit there, you know, and I'd, hang, I, I'd lean over the ball, I'd get my grip going, I, have, I address it the same way every time. I imagine much like a professional golfer does his, like, routine before he hits a golf ball. Mm -hmm. I mean, I played in this uh, – <laughs> uh, this – this uh, pro am tournament up at Riviera recently, and I sucked. And it was, and I'm not that bad of a golfer. But I didn't play very well, probably because I've never played under pressure. I've never played under people, and I don't have those solidified right. routines and like, what's my thought process going into this, right? So I do that. I get over the ball. I have my little way. I'd like tap my toe before 
I you know squat down, mm-hmm. I get the grip, I look up at the line in front of me, defensive line to see which way they're sort of stacking to know which way after I snap this I'll probably have to lean for the block yeah. right, and then I put down you know look look through my legs at the holder and pick a really small spot on his glove hand that he'd have planted on the ground right, and sometimes it was just the top of the he'd plant his hand like a upside down V. It's like the, the apex of that, you know, V. Maybe there's a Nike check on the glove or mm. something. And I just stare that damn thing down mm. until I hear the snap count or see his hand out of my periphery come up to snap it. I stare that thing down. And as soon as I get that sort of uh, opportunity to release the ball, it's just like the quickest thing ever. I can't even, mm. I don't even think about it. It happens so fast. It's like I imagine how someone on the starting blocks, a swimmer, you know, and waiting for that gun. As soon as the gun goes off, it's just that yeah. instinct. You just freaking and that's, fire that's, at that's it. That's coming in. from the reps, isn't it? You know, totally. That's, that's the only way to get that. The only way to get that. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what we can relate it to veteran-wise is that reaction to effect effect of enemy fire. You know, when you're doing the training, you know, you you know, you you do all those training. You do training and exercises with blanks again and again and again. So that when you hear that, bah, 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 you you return fire before you even, and then you're getting on the floor before you even know you've done it. Right. You know, because if you have to think and about it, and, and even so, in combat, the first time, oh, you in still, combat, you, yeah, well, you, you still think I, about it. But once you've been in a few gunfights, yeah. then it's like and, it's more. But the reason memory. it's different in combat yeah. is because the noise isn't the same. Because when someone's yeah. firing blanks at you, you just hear that. But when you hear that going past, you're like, "Oh, what's that? Oh, fuck!" Because that's the difference. Because you know, it's very hard to simulate shooting past somebody's. You know, shoot. I think once. You know, like the way that they bring it in, like augmented reality and stuff now, that will be able to be something that people can start, that you'll be able to have augmented reality where you hear that and you see dirt coming up around you and that kind of thing. But and still, the knowledge that you're not going to die versus I might die, it yeah, makes you I, react but I do, I, But so again, different. I do think it will reduce the fraction of a second true, time. True, Because it, it's like you'll have heard those sounds of rounds going, yeah. you know, rounds going like right by your head because... Right. You know, it's that that sound is new to you, right? You know, so you're like, oh, what's, what's going on here? You know, oh, that's someone trying to shoot me. You know, because it's like you hear that before you hear the actual, you hear the tss before you actually hear, you know, the the what you what you heard in training, that kind of like the the clatter. Um, so all right, so you played at Texas. Fair to say, you made success of that. Then, what was the next step for you? Well. <sighs> See, I finished my senior year at 30. I was 33 when I finished my senior year. And we didn't have a very good season. We had a new coach come in. Um, we we limped our way to a bowl game. We had a bunch of players suspended through the season, different things. And then we got destroyed in our bowl game. Arkansas, We played Arkansas. They beat the hell out of us. And it was just like, I was like, man, this kind of, <laughs> it's not a great ending to the career. <laughs> um, and, and I kind of thought that was it. And then... I got a call shortly after um, with an opportunity to play in the senior all-star, one of the senior all-star games. They have usually about three of them every year. And the big one is the senior bowl. Um, And then they have the East-West Shrine game. It wasn't either of those two. It was one they don't even have anymore. I think it was in its second or third year at the time, but they played it at the Citadel out in Charleston, which is a military academy. And um, the game was called the Medal of Honor Bowl. And it was actually like all these Medal of Honor recipients, the Medal of Honor Society, came to the game. And they were like, I don't know if they were the title sponsor or they're just the namesake for the mm-hmm. game. Probably just the namesake. Um, and so the way that works is you go out there. It's a bunch of other seniors. Most of the guys I was playing with were either going to be drafted in the middle to late rounds or undrafted free agents. And... They had scouts from every NFL team, Canada. So the, how, how, did you, how, did you get, how did you get onto it then? Because you weren't projected to be drafted. So. No, no, no. Well, they just, like, they need long snappers for even those games, okay. right? And it was and was it because you were, a mil, was the military connection something to do with it? Or? Yeah, I think so, you know. I mean, like, I was, I was definitely, like, a pretty good long snapper, but I was not, I don't know what the, I wasn't, I should have been in the top six if I went to one of those three. Right. And I, I don't think I was. I probably maybe t- maybe top twenty. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know, but I did go. To, I did play and started a th- a, for three years at a school like Texas, mm-hmm. and I did well. So like, that's seen as valuable. But I, I didn't have the size. Um, I didn't have the experience. You know, having only yeah. played really played for three years. Um, 
but they knew I had the work ethic. The story helped, the background. Um, my age didn't help me. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think because of that game. Like, just to give people context, sorry to interrupt me. Yeah. But just to give people context, we're talking, you're a decade older or more than these other guys. Yeah. Like, you know, most right. of these guys are, what, 21, 22? Yeah, 22. when I was a freshman, I was 29, and most freshmen were 18. Right. You know, you so my senior, when I, I was 33 when I was done, and most of those guys were 22, you know. So I was basically 11 years older than the average college football player through the whole time. So I, I get out to uh, uh, get out there, and they have practices all week. You know, you have like four or five practices during the week, and the scouts all come to the practices because that's where the real comp competition happens. Not that we're not competing in the game. Like, we're playing for sure, but the game's more about, like, it's just kind of fun. You know what I mean? It's like an all-star game. Yeah. Um, well, it is an all-star game, but it's like an all-star game in, like, the NFL or uh, – basketball it's more competitive than that but still it's like no one really cares if they win or lose mm -hmm. but in all the practice reps my guys are out there trying to, to beat one another whoever's across the ball from you like you're trying to show off for these scouts right mm -hmm. and like i said there's like a hundred of them there from all these different teams and throughout the week they interview the players as well you know and i got uh, interviewed by f uh, four different teams while i was there and honestly when i when it first happened i was kind of like I'd appreciated it, but I thought I was like, well, they're just, they're just being nice. You know what I mean? <laughs> they just want to hear my story. Um, Cause at 30, at 34, it's like, that's older than 95% of the NFL. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? And uh, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sitting down with teams like the Dolphins and uh, I think the Arizona Cardinals and um, the Chicago Bears, maybe the Vikings. I can't remember exactly who the Browns, the Browns too. Um, and I looked at those rosters, and actually, like most of their snappers were older guys that are maybe going to retire, or you know, the spot wasn't solidified. So I was like, "That's interesting. Maybe they are sort of interested in me." Uh, and so in these interviews, I you know, as we got later into them, I was asking, "Like, do you think I have a legitimate shot? Like, what do you think?" And they're like, "Yeah, I think you do. You know, uh, you are older, but you're a good snapper." And you're a decent athlete, you know. Some of the long snappers in the league aren't the best athletes. It's all about the consistency of that snap and if you can block or not. But you're going to have to put some weight on. So I uh, got done with that, came out to L.A., started training at Unbreakable Performance Center, which is Jay Glazer's gym. And um, I put on about 30 pounds in roughly four months. And it wasn't all good weight. <laughs> but I had to, you know, just to get an opportunity. I knew I had to be at least 220. Um, and I think when we got around a pro day, I was like, I was close, like 219, I think, for pro day. And uh, went out there for pro day back at Texas where basically it's players from Texas that are draft eligible that have a chance of maybe making it. And s once again, scouts will come out and they clock you on different drills and stuff like that. And then you snap and, and uh, did well there too. And then the draft rolls around, and uh, they go through all seven rounds, and I didn't get drafted. I was talking to a couple teams, but they didn't do it, which I totally understand. Long snappers rarely get drafted anyway. There's mm -hmm. maybe maybe one a year. Sometimes there's none. Um, and as soon as the last pick in the draft was made, uh, my phone rang, and I got a call from the uh, St. Louis Rams, and they said they wanted to they wanted to sign me, and I was like that's awesome. I really appreciate that, you know? And so I call my agent and all that. And he's like, he's like, yeah, he's like, they, I think they do. And he's like, but I think you're about to get another call too. So just hold off on that. You don't need to make a decision now. You know, you'll have half hour or so to <coughs> make your pick. Mm -hmm. And the next phone call was from Pete Carroll. Uh, well, are you the Seattle, yourself? Yeah. Ah, from, the, cool. from the Seahawks. So Pete Carroll called and said he wanted to sign me and give me an opportunity up there in Seattle. And, uh, they had been to back-to-back -back Super Bowls. They were the best team in the NFL. I mean, from Richard Sherman to Marshawn Lynch to Russell Wilson to Michael Bennett to Cam Chancellor to Earl Thomas, uh, Doug Baldwin, Bobby Wagner. Like, they just – they had all the stars. You know yeah, what I mean? It was a hell of a team. It was like that squad then. Yeah. That time was insane. Unbelievable. And so I was like, I can't pass that up, <laughs> even if I don't make it. Because my I knew my odds were going to be bad anyway. Like, the, the chances of me making it all the way through were not great. And so I talked to my dad, you know, asked what he thought. And he said, all things, he's from the North Pacific Northwest too. He's from Oregon. Um, but also he was just like, man, all things being equal. Like if I were you, you know, you're going to regret it if you don't 
go after you know mm-hmm. chase the greatness there yeah and uh you know at the time st louis rams weren't very good they went four and 12 i think the year before and like i said the seahawks C- have been back-to-back super bowl so i called back and said uh i got yeah i kind of knew was on the st louis squad at that time you what i wouldn't be able to name you chris long oh that's <laughs> yeah. yeah you're like i don't know who that is no, he's the, the tackle <laughs> yeah d yeah. tackle oh, no he's a d end the end Kyle oh. Long is the tackle. That's his brother. Uh, oh, I didn't know. <laughs> which, is the, which is the one that goes to MVP? Uh, well, both of them have been. But you ca- Kyle, oh, no, I'm thinking Kyle. of someone different anyway, aren't I? I'm thinking of what's his name? The big... Uh, Andrew Whitworth. That's who I'm thinking yeah. of. Yeah. <laughs> he so was a... Yeah, yeah, yeah he was an L.A. Yeah. Uh Anyway. So that's what I did. And I went up to training camp. Went through uh, OTAs, which is sort of the off-season... So organized team activities, I call it. It's off-season training camp without pads. And then you just wear helmets. And then going to training camp which is full pads and everything and then got to play in one preseason game before he got cut <laughs> but it was an unbelievable experience man you get to, to run out with the flag yeah i led the team out with the american flag like i i, I did that in college as well um for every game and um, this was cool that the team asked me to do that right before the game actually the equipment yeah. manager came up and usually they have a uh, an active duty veteran run out with the flag and they just asked me to do it yeah. and i was like i would love to i was still no, I had just gotten out of the guard, so I just I had just finished my service, but so I ran out there with the ran led the team out of the tunnel with the flag. I knew I was told before the game like um, I'm they're gonna have the reg the guy that had been there six years, a long snapper was gonna play in the first half, and I was gonna play the whole second half. And so I knew I wasn't playing right away, but I'm out there warming up pregame like nervous as hell, and Peyton Manning standing right next to me throwing balls because he was. Uh, it was his last season with the Broncos. Right. They went on to win the Super Bowl that year. Right. You know, uh, in his last season. So uh, it was pretty cool. And it was in CenturyLink Field in Seattle. It was raining with the sun out, which is so, yeah. <laughs> so Seattle. Yeah. Uh, and the, it was full house, even though it was a preseason game, wow. just because the fans are nuts team. and they were very good at the time. Yeah. And they just couldn't, you know, it was the first yeah. game of the year. Um, it was an incredible experience, man. I, I remember being on the sideline during the anthem. And um, I wasn't really prepared for it because in college, the teams are still in the locker room during the anthem. Mm. They don't come out on the field till after. So that was my first time being on the field during the anthem. And, you know, I stood there with my hand on my heart facing the tallest flag in the building, and I just started crying like a baby. Yeah. Uh, it was – a lot of it was just – Understandable, bro. It was just the emotion of the moment. Mm-hmm. It was like – it's also thinking of um, the guys in the unit, you know, that were proud of me. Um, whether they were alive or not, uh, because they knew that this was something, some crazy dream I had, you know, yeah. when I was in Iraq. Yeah. Uh, but also, like, thinking about ve- veteran or not, you know, people that don't have a lot of self worth, which I didn't have before I went to the Darfur, and I had to build that over time and put myself through some tough stuff and um, get out there and challenge myself to build that self belief. Um, and also just like proud to to be there and have that chance, man, and proud of myself, selfishly, I guess. Uh it was just crazy, man. I, I'd never I'd never the only other time I cried during the anthem was after Seer School <laughs> when they liberated <laughs> us and the flag went up. <laughs> but that's because I was just totally destroyed. Yeah, first the for people listening, this the that's the uh, basic survive was it survive, escape, resist, evade. Exactly yeah. it. Survival, yeah. evasion, resist and escape. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So um, it's like a P- mock POW yeah, camp. Yeah. Mock POW camp, and then when they raise the flag at the end, that's that means it's the end. So yeah, <laughs> and almost everybody cry cries. Really. You know, um, right, bro. Like we got a million and one things we could talk about to go going on. So, um, have you got anything burning you'd like want to talk about for the ten minutes that you got urgent stuff to put out? Uh, if, if not, then I want to pick. I'll pick MVP otherwise. Yeah. But if you've got, um, but if you have, we'll anything. talk about. I'll talk about Water Boys real quick before okay, MVP, sweet. and then we'll end with MVP. Okay. So Water Boys. Speaking of Chris Long, mm-hmm. um. And like circling back to Africa, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 2000, and I think he established it in f- maybe 2014 or 15. While I was with the Seahawks, uh, Chris was following my story. He was playing for the St. Louis Rams at the time. And he had been to Tanzania before. And it was sort of like a, it was a trip called like Pros for Africa or something. And he got to climb Mount Kilimanjaro and spend time with the people. But he felt leaving there kind of guilty like I got to experience this place and meet these people but what can I do for them further so he started a, a clean water initiative where he was going to raise uh, money 
amongst the 32 NFL teams for 32 clean water wells to be put in East Africa, specifically Tanzania first. That was his goal, initial goal, which he's surpassed since then. Well, after I got cut, the next day, literally the next day, when I'm just like, what do I do now? <laughs> you know what I mean? And like thoughts of joining the military again crossed my mind. Yeah. Uh, he called me and was like, I'd never met him before. And he was like, hey man, I've been following your story. I think it's awesome. He's like, but what sticks out to me, not that I'm not grateful for your service to the military or to the country in the military, but was your time in the Darfur before because this is what I'm doing. And he told me about Water Boys. He's like, I want you to be on the team. He's like, I don't even know what that looks like. Mm. You know, if you're an ambassador of some type, but if you're interested, I'd love to see if we can work something out. And I said, yeah, that'd be awesome. I said, is there any way we can involve like veterans in it? And he was like, yeah, that'd be great. And I was like, all right, let me think about it. So I like get on a stair climber and one of the options on the stair climber is Kilimanjaro. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not really Kilimanjaro, but it's like, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Those like yeah. those high tech stair climbers where you can, mm -hmm. you act like you're climbing a, you know, uh, the Leaning Tower of Pisa or yeah. Kilimanjaro or whatever. And so Ta Kilimanjaro was in Tanzania. I Googled it to double check, but I was pretty sure <laughs> that Kilimanjaro was in Tanzania, you know, and this is before I knew that he'd gone out and climbed it himself. And I was like, what if I went up there with like a wounded vet, you know, an amputee specifically, I took him up or her up, we climbed the mountain together, but we raised funds in the process. So we like, we let people know, Hey, this is what we're doing. Um, sponsor us not to pay for our trip but so we can leave something in that country like a clean water well mm -hmm. and we had a lot of people on board including including people in my family people in the military community but also like microsoft at the time jumped on board we did a big fundraiser up there and we raised enough money for two water wells actually and so when blake the first guy i took blake and i went out there just me and him we go out and we get to visit these villages and the people and see the impact it makes that clean water um, it changes their lives. And it's something we've talked about a couple times in this podcast, but it, it was also like circling back to initially why I wanted to serve my country. You know what I mean? F to provide, um, how, I, I shouldn't call them luxuries because they should just be basic needs. Yeah, it should be basic But they are basic. luxuries yeah. for these yeah. people in these parts of the world that just would never have access to it. Um, fighting for those that can't fight for our, for themselves, you know? That's... Uh, that's like a mantra that I've tried to I try to live by still, and it it's they saved me. Those people in Africa saved me initially, um, so this is an opportunity to try and give back and and help save them. And um, that's been really powerful. So now every year, we go up with a team, uh, roughly ten to twelve veterans and NFL players. Um, I think pretty much every year we've had someone that's that's an amputee. We've had a blind Green Beret. Mm. You know, Kirsty Ennis came yeah. with us one year. Um, the Green Beret is a, a guy named Ivan who's an unbelievable man, and he's ran like 60 marathons, and he's a beast. And uh, uh, several others. We had a guy named Doc Jacobs who lives in San Diego uh, who recently came back on his second try and summited this year. Uh, but every year the coolest part of the trip is – seeing the impact we've made and going back to those villages, getting to hang out with the kids at these schools and orphanages, you know, and they have a clean water, a solar powered, fully sustainable clean water well on site. And that's why they built the school there. You know what I mean? So it's like, it impacts the community in so many other ways. So that's really cool. And then, and then MVP, which you've been to, let me hear your quick take on a uh, MVP, man. Well, if you want to learn more about MVP, you should pick up brothers in arms by Garen Jones, because I do talk about it in there. Um, I'm a big fan, dude. Like, I, one of the things I think is the the biggest challenge facing not only veterans but people in general is purpose, right? Now, you don't have too much time to worry about purpose when you are living somewhere like Sudan because your purpose is to go out and get clean survive. water and survive. <laughs> yeah. But we do have the luxury of having other things. And if you don't, that's where I think so much mental health problems can come from is not having a purpose, not having a team mm -hmm. around you. Because I think, again, team is something okay people always say from the military yeah i missed the, the the you know missed my team but i think as people we're supposed to be in teams we're supposed to be in tribes you know oh, yeah we're packing all, all all of us are <laughs> so it doesn't matter like military or not and um yeah i think uh you know you identified it my friend uh dean uh, dean starts being on the podcast he talked about it a lot as well as these similarities between if you come out because the thing is about military and um professional sports people is you had a purpose and uh, so then it's it's the 
it's the jarring like loss of purpose because a lot of people don't have it but because they've never had it there's less of, it's less of a That's thing right. it's yeah. just like in the back of your mind rather than this huge thing of it's basically go it's like coming off a drug or something it's you've had something and and all of a sudden you go into this with you feel it's like you know you need for instance people that smoke or drink every day they do it to feel normal they don't get out they you know they don't get the high off it or whatever it's just this is what i do to need to be feel normal so when you've had that you know you've had that in the military you've had purpose every day um you know you might not have felt like you might not have known at the time but that deep down you had it and then you lose that it's like you don't feel yourself anymore it's like you feel like a totally different person and, and that's where i think a lot of this suicide comes from is what's the point it's not like this i'll, I'll never do anything as great as yeah i'll never do so anything as great again which you know comes down to why i didn't want to you know and you're the same we don't want to just harp on about the old stuff because if you do that how are you ever going to rediscover purpose if you are just constantly going on about what you had before i mean this is fucking impossible you can't go yeah. forward if you're looking back all the time exactly. or you can't you're gonna fucking fall in your face <laughs> and everyone will laugh at you including <laughs> me um so i think what so what you do is you know you bring in some players with so ex professional players who veterans look up to and you bring in veterans who with the weird thing is professional players look up to yep. so it's like these different groups of people that look up to each other get them in a mix the other thing as well is i've always say this you know fucking physical physical activity is the best medicine uh, unless you've got broken legs in which case you've probably well do yeah. some fucking pull-ups if you got it yeah that, that's true do some, get, do we, some fucking have, pull-ups. Th- there's people in there's, there that from all yeah. shapes and sizes when, and when the great thing about having friends with no uh with no arms and legs no offense to you guys i wish you hadn't lost them but you did um as you taught me taught me a fucking valuable lesson there's no fucking excuses to not do to not do pt exactly. if you've got a bad leg well guess what they're missing theirs and they're still getting to the fucking exactly gym. mostly a lot of those people have done way more physically demanding things since they lost yeah it. because it's just like a screw you world i'm gonna find a way yeah, i'm not a one, quitter one, and, and, they, and they've done things they never would have done yeah you know? and unlike you know i know plenty of people who we're talking mil- uh, we're talking mental uh mental um i don't like, i don't want to use the word on this whatever mental fucked upness <laughs> like yeah so pts or whatever who've had problems with it myself included um and people who have had physical injuries say it was the best thing that ever happened to them because it then made them go into that yeah fuck you mode but yeah do like I'm, I'm a fan um i'm a fan of mvp i think getting to people together exercising together in a team environment and then um what i kind of like about it as well is um now i'm in a position where i don't mind i'll talk openly about stuff i mean fuck's sake read a book about it have a podcast about it i don't mind now but for, for for talking is a very hard thing about it so what i like about the sessions you do is at the end people get around on the mats and like you have a little kind of like a little like a little talky session which and people i think are a lot more willing to talk once they've just done something with they've just you know you've done physical exertion with people right, yeah you know you're a lot more likely to talk then because you've vulner- just you've just vulnerable. you've just had some bond <laughs> you've just done some bonding and yeah and stuff there you know yeah and so it, I think it, it's a great it, it puts down a lot of it puts down a lot of guards people put up you mm-hmm. know when you when you put yourself through some physical exertion it, it requires a little bit of mental exertion because you, there's times in there especially a lot of the people that don't work out all the time that they kind of want to quit you know what i mean yeah. and then the guy or girl on their left and right is not quitting so they can't so then they got to yep. push themselves and they feel that bond and connection and then afterwards we, we you know we sit on that mat and everyone's just like well, not everyone but people are more uh adept to be vulnerable and open and and very honest mm-hmm. and like we we encourage you know, sharing what you got going on if it's like tough stuff it doesn't have to be military related yep. if it's good stuff like we want to hear about what people are doing well and we live in a society where we just don't share stuff that much. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, we do. We share what coffee we just bought. Yeah, we, we share like the tweet. dumb stuff. Yeah, we share dumb stuff. Real, but the stuff, real stuff, real stuff. Yeah, the stuff yeah. that matters. Uh, but I think, like, I think since, uh, I think it's probably about three years ago now since I came down to MVP, probably about mm-hmm. that, which yeah. is scary. But um, <laughs> I think in that period, I do think it's become more normal now for people to to share stuff. Yeah. Um, and we want to bri- yeah. bri- bridge that. So, that, you know, there's obviously taboo about mm-hmm mental health talk admitting that there has been a long time anyway admitting that you're struggling right and it's like seen as always been seen as a weakness Mm -hmm. to say you know i'm not doing so hot i need help where it's the exact opposite it's way more courageous especially as like in this hyper masculine society and profession of professional sports and being in the military uh it's way more 
courageous to just admit it and be like, hey, like, I'm not going to quit. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, like, right now, I'm having an issue with this. Yeah. Does anybody know? Has anybody else felt that or in the same boat? And, like, what, what can I do? What do you think I should try and do, you know? And the, someone else in that room has gone through the exact same thing yeah. or something very similar. Um, both those careers and, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, if you're really, really lucky. And then it's like you had this extreme high with the uniform and the locker room and the camaraderie and purpose and the family. You know, I just imagine like if your family was just jacked from you yep. all of a sudden. It's like that's traumatic, man. That's hard. So that, that, that to me was harder than anything I saw with my own eyes over there or experienced or even like losing yeah. brothers. That was harder. Yeah, and so that's all we're doing, man. We're just we're, we're normalizing that conversation. And I think adding the athlete element Obviously, it's not going to war. Playing a sport is not anything like combat. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is, like, we want as a, in the veteran community, we need more um, relatable experiences and be, people to be able to understand where we're coming th from and like to be able to have a conversation with us and be like, "Look, yeah, I, I didn't go to combat, but I know what you're thinking. I know what you're going through. I know what you're feeling because that feels like this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and that's all we're trying to do and just uh, build that team up again." Love it, bro. Uh, we got a lot more to talk about, mate. We're going to have to do another one of these before I leave town. It's, it's going to be in four months when the quarantine's lifted and there's yeah, like the last 20 people. Alive. Like, I feel like I've got a good, I feel like I've got a good chance to survive in the uh, upcoming purge that's going to happen around here. we got a lot of guns in the house that I'm staying. Everyone knows how to use them. And in California, I feel like it's on the California with probably an advantage there. Um, you know, in that capacity. So I believe I'll be around for us to do another one. Nice. Uh, mate, where can people find MVP? Where can people find yourself? Uh, vetsandplayers.org is MVP. Waterboys.org slash Killy, K-I-L-I, short for Kilimanjaro, for Waterboys, and at NateBoyer37 or NateBoyer.com. Cool. And I'll tag you up and everything. Cool. Um, mate, thank you so much for coming on. I said mate then, not Nate. That's all right. But... Um, you can call me anything. It's like if there's anything, if it's uh, I want to leave people with one thing. Cause there's a lot of you've said like a lot of really interesting stuff there, from the sports stuff to the Kilimanjaro stuff to you know the Sudan stuff. If there's one thing that you can leave people with, one thing take away for any veterans listening or anybody, just anybody listening who's out there trying to better themselves, get through tough times, anything like that, then what would you say? That you're absolutely capable. Of, of greatness without obstacles there is no greatness so understand all those challenges and all those you know burdens and things that you think you can't overcome like not only is it possible they're necessary for you to become great and they're going to make you tougher and stronger and if you don't know like if you're having trouble finding a purpose and you like don't know what i'm what i'm supposed to be or who you're supposed to be first of all it can change 15 times it doesn't matter um, but just try things. There's everybody has things they're interested in. People will be like, I don't know, I don't know. BS. There's something. Maybe you're just not brave enough to admit it. There's something you're interested in. It might be way outside the box. You have no experience in that deal, right? But hey, I I never I never knew anything about you know being a Green Beret. I didn't even know what it was really until I signed up. I'm too late. And then uh, football, I never played before. I figured it out. And now I'm out here in Hollywood hustling, man, and making some things happen. And I still got a long way to go. It's really hard, and yeah. you know it's challenging and 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 competitive and all these things but it's the hustle and the grind and the journey that i love man that's what makes me feel whole and happy uh so just try things just try those things and you might like them you might not if you don't move on to something else and just keep going i love it dude right? it's easy it's so simple it's, we, it's we complicate sim the crap sim out it's of simple things. it's not easy it's not but, e but, exactly. it's, but it's simple Very true. It, it really is Very no true. i second everything you just said bro uh thanks for coming on mate love you love, love you guys more, for listening bro. oh God, I'm gonna give you a big old cuddle no, right now. I'm not gonna do that. I know. <laughs> yeah, you guys catch you on the next episode. Love you, bye. Yeah. Listen. Shout out teaser. You told me not to worry, and you wouldn't break my heart You told me you were sorry, and yeah, my whole world fell apart You said it's not my fault, and yeah, I've never done you wrong I'm grinding to a halt, now I can see you're moving on I promised I'd get better, and I told you things would change You keep me to the gutter, yeah, I'll never be the same I've got to let you go, now live your life and spread your wings And yeah, you put on quite a show, and pulled the puppet strings And are you sure that you don't want me? Remember all the pain 
Or maybe you should thank me, it's your loss and my gain I'm leaving now forever, I won't hang my head in shame But yeah, you've taken me for granted, and you should feel ashamed You sold a dream to all of us, a dream that we'd all die for A reason for us all to live and something we could fight for I might just help a man up to his feet or hold a newborn But no matter what I do, my hands remembering my rifle, yeah Life's hard, I know that, still wouldn't change shit I wouldn't go back, yeah, I wouldn't go back Feelings I hold back Memories fade, yeah, they go fast, yeah, they go fast Good times they come and go, survive the highs and lows Just take it step by step, I guess, yeah, I suppose Good times they come and go, survive the highs and lows Just take it step by step, I guess, yeah, I suppose